Uh, good evening, all delegates. On behalf of Zaire, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Sampat Chandra Rao, eminent ENT surgeon from Bangalore, whose area of interest are skull-based surgery, head and neck oncosurgery. And today, Dr. Sampat Rao will facilitate for today's discussion. So for any queries you have from for the faculty, you can type in the chat box, so which can be addressed during or after the interactive session. So Dr. Sampat, it's over to you, sir. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Team Zydus, uh, Team Ian Tuned. Um, it's a brilliant idea. You have a brilliant platform, um, and um, it's uh, uh, it's an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to uh, be moderating this uh, August panel uh, of um, um, uh, leaders in ENT. I would say and anesthesia from various parts of the world. And um, um, uh, and this discussion on um, what uh, we do in, in these times of COVID, uh, what we call the COVID era, which I'm pretty sure is not going to go off um, uh, soon. It's wishful thinking for all of us to think that we would this would get over in the next few weeks or months. I think it's going to be here for some time. So we need to know that uh, firstly, we need to accept that we need that this is here to stay for some time for a year or maybe even more. And we need to gear up and do things accordingly. We need to change our, um, our um, lifestyles, our professional uh, outlook and a lot of things. And that's what uh, we are going to do in the next uh, hour, hour and a half. So I have with me uh, some brilliant minds and um, uh, very uh, senior uh, uh, ENT surgeons and anesthesiologists in this panel. So, uh, so let me first begin by thanking uh, our partners, Zydus, uh, and their divisions, Respicare and uh, Ian Tune. Of course, is the platform on which uh, the um, whole program is telecasted uh, live. Apart from the Zoom links, I'm sure a lot of you are live here on Zoom with us. But uh, uh, this Zoom platform holds uh, 1,000 people, and I'm I'm quite optimistic that uh, we we would reach there and probably even more. So, for those of you who cannot zoom in because uh, you are late, you can always go to the Facebook uh, platform and see the same uh, uh, webinar live uh, and, and, uh, and you can join us there. So we have with us um, uh, five panelists. I'm going to introduce each one of them uh, individually in a while. Uh, and we have this agenda. So this is important. So we need to um discuss some very important things see i, I myself and I'm, I'm pretty keen to listen to what everybody has to say my friends have to say my co-panelists have to say because i uh, myself am um, uh, looking forward to learning a lot from this panel here so the agenda slide begins with the, the covid updates we are briefly going to cover the covid stats with each uh, 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 with each one of us uh, and the countries that, that we come from, we are going to listen to briefly to the COVID stories, I would say. And uh, then we go on to the role of screening, briefly talk about uh, the technical aspects of screening and whether we're doing, getting it right. Then we talk about elective surgery uh, and uh, how uh, 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 post lo the lockdown, and most countries have seen a lockdown. Uh, whether it's the right time for us to begin our uh, clinical practice and, and our OPDs and theater. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, and uh, then we come to the, the core um, part of this presentation, that is, how do we go about organizing our OPDs and inpatients and, uh, and our uh, surgical uh, theaters uh, uh, as we go ahead and do our ENT, skull base, head and neck practice. And then we're briefly going to touch upon um, the future of clinical uh, medical education, which uh, I think uh, is going to be uh, webinars. So a lot of webinars are being conducted uh, ev practically every day. And uh, I think this is the, the way forward. And then we're going to talk about telemedicine and how this is the beginning of the end of office culture. So that's me. I come from a place called uh, Bangalore. Bangalore is um, uh, is uh, the capital of uh, the state of Karnataka, which is down south in India. It's a beautiful state. We have a lot of things for those of you who want to come to visit uh, us in Bangalore. 
um, we have palaces, we have wildlife, we have uh, good food, uh, we have pretty ladies, we have art, culture, so a lot of things uh, uh, for White Sea especially, you know, so you've not uh, um, visited India, I guess, have you? No, I, I'm not, I think you haven't, isn't it? Oh, not yet. Not yet. Okay, so so this is all we have um, uh, for you uh, when you come down to India. So that's um, me as a moderator. I would like to introduce uh, my uh, uh, colleague and uh, a friend, I would say, because we had um, uh, a wonderful time uh, together in New Zealand when I visited New Zealand as a part of the GSC uh, team uh, uh, way back in 2009, close to 10, 11 years. And Dr. Subhash Chandra Shetty is uh, a renowned uh, ENT surgeon specialized in head and neck surgeries and uh, uh, based out of uh, Auckland in uh, New Zealand. And uh, New Zealand is a beautiful city. I've been there myself. Uh, some wonderful sites. The North Island is so full of beauty, more so the South Island, I would say, but uh, uh, but there are some, uh, you know, I, I have very, very fond memories of my one month in New Zealand. And this is the picture that I was talking to you about, Subhash. So this, we looked uh, much younger. So I practically look like a boy. And um, so that's that. those were wonderful um, days and times that we spent in your house. Thanks for hosting us. Uh, so the dog must be quite old now. So. Yeah, no, she's here. <laughs> she's yeah, sleeping. Wonderful. It's one thirty. <laughs> her sleep time. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yes. So let me tell you, Subhash is uh, joining us bang in the middle of uh, uh, the the darkest part of his night because it's it's past twelve now, one thirty. Yes. So thanks, Subhash, again. Great effort from you, and uh, I really appreciate right. the fact that you're joining us this late. And um, uh, also, White Sea. I think it's quite late there. What's the time, White Sea, at your end? Oh, it's at 9.30. 9.30, okay. A little sane, but uh, it's quite insane for Subhash. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, thank you, Subhash, for joining us. Uh, Arun, uh, again, is a great friend, and um, we met uh, for the first time at Sheffield. So, this is his the place where he practices. Um, up north in so one of the most beautiful parts of UK, I would say. Uh, Lanarkshire in Scotland. Uh, with, uh, with all the sights and the mysteries, with the Loch Ness monster mystery, and, and of course, uh, the whiskey, you know, so it can't get better than uh, Scotland for all the uh, wonderful uh, drinks that they serve there. So uh, this is uh, the picture of us together in uh, Sheffield. Uh, it was one wonderful program. That was the last time we met. Uh, great smiles, you see, as you see here, we had, uh, uh, we spent about three or four days together. It was great. Uh, thank you, Ar Arun, once again for uh, joining us. And um, uh, what time is it in UK? Uh, it's only half past two in the afternoon. Half past two. Okay. Bad, it... Yeah. It's very, very good time here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Subhash, you want to say something? No, no, no. Carry on, please. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Not a problem. So uh, I think Arun and Subhash know each other quite well as well. So, yes. so. We do. Yes, yes, of course. And White Sea um, is the charm of this program. So uh, White Sea is the deputy chief of the division of pathology and neurotology. Uh, and she has a brilliant department uh, and um, uh, uh, in the University of Hong Kong. And she works at the ENT department uh, in the Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong. And that's uh, her brilliant, brilliant setup. You know, it's, it's huge. Yeah? White Sea, I've not been there, but it's huge. It's uh, it's 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 a dream, wonderful. So, residential uh, and not hospital. Uh, that was what. The backgrounds are residential areas. Oh, it's I see. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right, brilliant. So that's uh, that's where she works, and that's where Hong Kong is. I've been there, and um, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's uh, uh, it's th those are the statistics there that's provided by White Sea. It's a population of. Um, 7.4 million, 74 million, sorry. Uh, and uh, the density is quite high, as you see, uh, uh, for, it's, it's for, a, for a small place, that's, that's quite a number of people living there. And, and that, again, adds on to the challenge of dealing with COVID in a, in a, in a cluster. So we, we're going to talk about that. Uh, that's Hong Kong. Uh, we all so see. Close viewer with China and with that. Ah. 
the map. Yes, yes, that's that's the reason you're here. You know, I, we want to know what's happening in China, you know, and there's not much of information coming. So we, we want to hear a lot about what's happening there from you. Well, I, I, we actually being close, but um, we know the same information they release, you know. Yes. The thing, the thing is how close we were, we were with China and where the, the COVID-19 start all with. Yes. And we have a really high density when compared to everywhere else in the, in the country and in mm -hmm. the world. So we will share how we deal with it. Uh, we still maintaining a low infection rate. Perfect. Perfect. We look, look forward to hearing from you about, about what happened there. So that's uh, us back at the Grupo, wonderful times and uh, great memories. So we must catch up again soon, White Sea. Uh, and uh, Uya is from Italy. He's a brother, great friend, and uh, one of the finest men I've met. Italy, I don't need to you know, show a slide on Italy. It's, it's everybody's uh, dream fantasy. It's such a beautiful country. It's my second home. I was there for close to six, six and a half years. And uh, there's no country that has so much uh, to give the world than uh, Italy. There's so much of art and beauty and uh, culture and food and there's just about everything that uh, that uh, appeals to uh, someone in Italy. So um, this is uh, this is Puya's, uh, uh, you know, busy activity. So he. Uh, keeps himself busy all the time. He's got a meeting right after, he's got a webinar right after this, you know, so uh, uh, it's very difficult to keep him down. He keeps doing one thing after another, webinar after another, writing books, writing chapters. That's, uh, you remember that, Puya? So you look yeah, sure. like as well, you know, so you look 10 years, it's, it's not 10 years back, but it looks like uh, both, both of us were uh, you know, well, in Turkey, there was uh, one week before the attempt, and they got uh, like it's something we were in where, Ankara, where, where we were, Ankara, yes, Turkey, yeah, it was in Turkey. <laughs> with, with the maestro with Jacques Magnan and then uh, Perkay, the ex president of Vienna. So, uh, wonderful, wonderful memories. Uh, Chetan again is uh, like a brother, he's um. Uh, we we go a long way back together. He comes from Abu Dhabi. He's a, 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 a specialist in anesthesiology at the uh, Ahalia Hospital in Abu Dhabi. Keeps coming down to India quite often, and that's when we have all the fun. Uh, again, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. These are beautiful cities. The mosque in Abu Dhabi is phenomenal. I have family there. My father stays in Dubai, so you know, a very fond place for me. And that's, that's where um, Chetan comes from. It's a city uh, called Udupi, uh, a, a small hamlet of a city uh, where I come from too as well. So my roots are here. That's the Udupi Sri Krishna temple, which is very, very famous. It attracts millions of devotees from all over the world, beautiful beaches. And, uh, and that's the last time we met Chetan. And I yes. remember more of the food than I remember <laughs> you guys meeting. I can never forget. Uh, the tons of food that we ate in uh, in, in the joint that uh, <laughs> so oh, brilliant brilliant memory. yeah hello everyone yeah i yeah i'm the odd man out basically yes chetan is an anesthesiologist now there's a reason so if i finished yes so i've finished introducing there's a reason for, uh, for having this panel here if you see we have uh, ent surgeons and then we have an anesthesiologist we have people uh, coming from uh, china we have panelists from china which is the country where it uh, very close to China, Hong Kong, very close to China. So this is uh, uh, where uh, the epidemic began. Then we have New Zealand, uh, uh, which is probably the only country that has declared itself COVID free, officially declared itself COVID free. That's very interesting. We'd like to hear Subhash uh, talk about it. Italy, Puya from Italy again. Uh, Italy took a very hard hit very um, bought the brand for a long time and it's uh, things are getting better now so and puya himself is a covid survivor you know so he was infected with covid and he was in the front line doing all the hard work uh, as i told you it's difficult to keep him down uh, he has to be in the thick of things and i'm sure he got there sooner than later so uh, we we would like to hear from puya uh, all all that you have to say because you are the only one among almost everyone out here in this um, Zoom meeting who's actually uh, contracted the disease. 
Arun uh, is from UK, which is now the epicenter. You know, UK and the US are uh, uh, hit uh, fairly badly, and uh, Arun is in the thick of things again. And a couple of very important um, issues to be discussed as far as Arun's inventions or uh, you know his techniques are concerned, and uh, we need to talk about it. So, and then Chetan, yes, from Abu Dhabi, and uh, an anesthesiologist perspective is very important in this program. So that's the reason why the panel has been laid out like the way uh, it is. Now, let me quickly go uh, into the history of pandemics. Um, uh, just a word. So this is not new to the to mankind. Uh, uh, back at the in the Roman Empire, there, there was the Antonine Plague that uh, killed practically five million people. That was uh, uh, 165 to 180 CE. Uh, but there was another one, uh, a bigger uh, pandemic that killed about 50 million people. That came from China, India, and uh, this was called the Plague of Justinian. That struck uh, the world in the sixth century. It spread to the Great Lake. Uh, regions of Africa via overland and, the, and, and through the sea routes. The Black Death is um, quite familiar to many of us who have um, read our history books. This was caused uh, by a bacillus that was carried by fleas and rodents. Uh, the plague entered Italy, carried by rats on Genoese trading ships and the Genoese fleets. Genoa is, has uh, prides itself as a naval epicenter of the medieval world. So um, uh, trading ships sailing from the Black Sea, it was called the Black Death because it killed 200 million people. Another 100 million people were killed uh, in 1660, around 1665, in the Great Plague of London. Then came the Spanish flu, which uh, hit America uh, in a big way. Uh, 50 million people were killed. Apparently, it still exists. The, the, the virus still continues in the American population, and it uh, no longer, perhaps no longer kills, but it's still um, doing its business. HIV AIDS is uh, what we all grew up listening to, fearing, you know, so this was another uh, uh, big and important uh, pandemic that uh, wiped off 25 to 35 million people across the world. Fortunately, we have uh, insulated ourselves to this, uh, to the effects of this virus because we have medicines and, uh, and what we can pro possibly call a cure for uh, HIV. The SARS uh, group of um, viruses hit uh, the world around the 2000s and ever since we've been having one or the other uh, SARS virus coming out. There have been a few strains that have come out and in fact, and then the Ebola uh, epidemic came out, which didn't kill too many people. You see that the SARS epidemic of 2000-2003 created a lot of buzz and scare, but it just killed about 774 people. Uh, the death toll in Ebola was much higher, hit the African countries much more than any other place. Uh, the MERS uh, virus, again, uh, originated from Saudi Arabia, uh, killing about 850 people. Uh, the COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus disease 19, as we call it, uh, again, comes from the SARS-CoV uh, uh, strain or the family. And uh, as of uh, date, unfortunately, it's uh, killed um, or it's taken a death toll of 308, uh, uh, close to 318,000 people. And uh, we are set to see bigger numbers uh, in the days to come. So that's how COVID uh, is kind of uh, stacked up versus the remaining uh, pandem uh, pandemics that we've seen in the past. Now, let's get into the agenda straight away. As I told you, we're going to first deal with uh, uh, a little bit of a story from each one of us about how things began in our country and how things progressed. And then we're going to get into the role of screening, the state of elective surgery as it is in our countries, COVID precautions that we take in our individual practice, what's the future in terms of education, what's the general future in terms of how we go about dealing with uh, 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 things in the COVID era. So White Sea, so uh, coming from Hong Kong, you're close to, very, very close to the place where it all began. So I would like you to take your slides from here and tell us uh, about uh, how it all uh, started and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, please explain your slides. Well, how I can help you with your slides by moving them when you ask me to move the slides. So go ahead, White Sea. We Thank yeah, you. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Sam, for your kind introductions. And uh, really like uh, going through the world. And we have been locked down here for almost half an 
six months now. And, and so it's nice to go around the country in, in your slice. So from this, this slide, actually you can see very clearly that um, Hong Kong is very close to China, but um, it, the number and the growth rate of the um, uh, confirmed case, and both the confirmed cases and also the death rates are at, at very low side. And uh, can go to the next slide. And this is all because of our experience of SARS. So uh, Sam has mentioned about uh, SARS that actually originates from China and uh, we have a bad impact on that in 2003. By that time, I was still a... Um, and by that, before then, actually we do not only on the infectious disease. But um, we actually, uh, after the SARS, we now know how they are uh, related, how the pandemics works and how the precautions we have made. So um, it, by that time we have uh, lost quite a number of medical staff as well, but we can manage it to get through it in a few months time from March to July. Next slide, please. So uh, we have this kind of tracing um, system in Hong Kong, which was updated every day. So um, if, if this is a map of Hong Kong and the dots showing uh, every buildings with confirmed cases. And from the experience of SARS, uh, if there is clustering of the, the cases in uh, one building, we actually evacuate the whole buildings and send the people to the um, isolation camp. So uh, we do all uh, the isolations and all the um, uh, uh, surveillance. So we have to know buildings and we have teachers. And so far uh, until yesterday, we have only 1,000 cases uh, confirmed and uh, discharged most of them. Only 26 of them are hospitalized and uh, four, four deaths in, um, until last uh, yesterday. Next slide, please. And this is the situation until um, yesterday. And uh, you, can, you can see, actually we started all the cases in actually uh, the 20, the, uh, the February, February um, early as early as February, so before the start of uh, all of you, but we climb up slowly and until we reach a peak at around March, by that time it, a peak in Europe and a lot of um, students studying in UK and the USA coming back and those are imported cases for us and very less of us uh, of that are local cases. Next please. So uh, these are the daily numbers uh, we see. So you also see the trend. So before the outbreaks in Europe and uh, we Actually, the local cases, uh, imported cases, are minimal. And um, since the uh, the students returned from the from the Europe and UK and USA, and the numbers of confirmed cases suddenly rise a lot. But we are able to control them and maintain a low level after they all come back and everything settles up, and then locked down uh, by the period of um, around one month time. Yes, so this is this is also showing the numbers that you can see uh, blue in blue is the reported case and uh, the local cases were in brown. So you can see most of them are imported case rather than a local um, a local spread of the disease. Next And uh, age distribution of men and females were quite equal for, for the confirmed cases in Hong Kong. And this actually showing uh, what uh, the surveillance and this uh, test we are doing, what, uh, what kind of people are getting the test. So not everyone uh, getting the test, but um, uh, number one is the case to build the reported criteria, including they have a contact history, they have travel history, they have occupational contact, and, um, and they have fever and symptoms. Number two is the uh, enhanced laboratory surveillance in a public hospital. So most of, um, in Hong Kong, 90% of the patients are doing in ho public hospital and they get 
as free of charge. And if they um, have any suspected symptoms, like or in a chest X-ray, there is any abnormalities, or sometimes even before they have a scheduled surgery or semi-urgent surgery, of course, most of our elective surgery has been blocked. But th those of them uh, will be getting tested before they um, they have to be isolated, get tested before we actually can uh, confirm whether he's a case or not. The, there are also, um, if there were patients symptomatic and they were worried about the, if they got a COVID infection, they can always go to the A&E department and general outpatient clinics to get a test. And um, some host, private hospitals, dedicated clinics um, are available for diagnosis, but, but they have a really small number of that. And uh, medical contact tracing especially for those imported case. So if they have a contact case, um, a confirmed case, and a contact history of those con uh, con confirmed cases, then we will do the contact tracing. So you can see in the um, table below, so they have uh, some clustering of the disease. So um, we group them, and these are diagnosed by mainly the contact tracing. and. Um, like the people have a hot pot dinner. So one of them are confirmed it and they were chased back. Oh, uh, that's actually two weeks before they actually has a family gathering in the new year, Chinese new year, and they have a family hot pot dinner. And then afterwards, most of them get infected in the same table. So um, most of them got chased it and isolated and eventually, um, and uh, the, some more clustering the bar and bank custards uh, has a really big number. And um, because after those uh, people coming back from the UK or the school cut down, and these mainly uh, occurred in March. So by that time, the people already isolated themselves for more than one month uh, or even almost two months. So people are getting um, less stressed. So they, they will go out to the bar. Since then, the government actually has closed down all the bars activities, restaurant activities, and uh, the, the cases seems to be dropped. The last one would be the enhanced uh, surveillance for asymptomatic in, uh, imported uh, travelers. So those travelers, um, even they were asymptomatic, but they are coming back from the high risk area. They will get, uh, they will be isolated in the airport. There will be a big area near the airport. Then they will stay there and get things checked before they can really come to the community and do home isolations. So after we uh, come, come back to Hong Kong, we have a strict two um, two weeks isolations um, at home and uh, they were given a handband and they were given calls to ask them to stay at home and uh, so this is our policy to prevent imported cases and prevent um, and trace all the possible contact cases in Hong Kong Next. so um, in and initially, although we do have the experience of uh, SARS, we do get a big fear, especially when the Chinese uh, Wuhan cases were so huge and they were so high that rate. And um, we, after the first, this is the pictures cooking, uh, after the first um, confirmed cases in Hong Kong, we are so feared that we clear up everything in the supermarkets and we really asked the government to close the border. And actually there are, um, three borders directly connecting to the China to China and uh, they can also come here by flight through the airports they we, we, we strictly request the um, governments to close all the borders immediately but of course they have uh, some uh, political social issues that um, they gradually close down the borders and usually if you have come to Hong Kong, it's huge amount of people, so high density, you can't even move yourself freely in the supermarkets. But now you can see all the, all the uh, malls are uh, uh, empty, um, everything's are empty. And next. Oh, sorry. So we close down our borders and of course we close down our schools and kids needs to wear masks. Everyone need to wear masks and in, when you want to go out, 
everyone got a mask on our face. So we have a surgical mask, like this is my kids and my husband. When we really need to go out, even go to the, lab, uh, the lift and we go downstairs to, to pick up our food or to, to check out um, mailbox, we do wear a mask because um, in, inside the lift it's a confined areas and it has high risk. Hand hygiene is uh, very important and edu uh, since then actually the school closed and everyone has an education at, 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 at home and they have a lot of Zoom lectures or um, on, uh, online lectures given um, by the school. And um, at home actually uh, we are quite uh, straight and so we have our uh, straight areas uh, at home we call it dirty zone that when we come back to at, from the hospital then we go to the dirty zone clean our hands clean our foot everything put down our, our t-shirts and then we get washed and get changed and then we we have our family time next and so um, uh, all of us actually knows that we do not have enough protections and do not have enough PPEs um, if there is a huge outbreak. So we actually had just at the very beginning of the of the event, we do have a strike and um, and we have to ask the government um, do not put our medical staff at risk. We have to we have to really close down the borders, and we are not we are not sacrificing ourselves because some of um, our, quite a number of medical staff um, died because of SARS. So we do not want that happen. So unfortunately, uh, and, and very fortunately in Hong Kong, there's no medical staff get, um, get um, uh, has a mortality in the medical staffs. Brilliant. Okay, right. Thanks, White C. We'll, uh, that, that was quite a uh, elaborate description of what happened during your uh, with, the, with the COVID situation in your country. Thanks uh, again. So I'll move on to Puya. Uh, uh, Puya, so these are your slides. So uh, you can go through them. And as I did with White C, I'll move the slides whenever you want uh, me to move. But these are okay, just a minute. Right. Just a minute. Let me uh, make sure that they don't go on. OK, anyway, not a problem. I'll, I'll do that later. It's just three slides. Right. Fine. Yeah. As Thank you, Sanford, and San, thank you for the organization for having me here. As you already said, I don't have that much time, so I think that in 20 minutes or 15 minutes, I have to leave the discussion, so I will be brief. This is the situation that happened to us from 25th of February and then spread in the last three weeks, I guess, mm -hmm. from the north area of Italy to the whole Italian community. So this is... Uh, uh, the, the situation that what happened was in three weeks uh, due to not a consistent uh, lockdown of the borders, the, the spread of the virus came huge. Um, different uh, region adopted different technique to prevent the situation. What happened was in fact that uh, two different regions that was uh, close one to each other, Lombardia and Veneto, adopted a different technique to prevent the spreading of disease. In fact, in order to address a better um, lockdown of Veneto, which is a close region onto, to uh, Lombardia, adopted a completely different behavior. And they was uh, obviously in search of the virus and they started suddenly to do a nasopharyngeal swab on all the patients and that's why there was completely changing of the behavior and the, and the, um, and the, unfortunately, the depth of the patients was completely different in the area. So the situation by yesterday was about five millions of people um, infected. Can you switch next next slide, please? Uh, yesterday, worldwide, five million death uh, confirmed cases and three hundred twenty-eight thousand of deaths, and in Italy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and in Italy, as you can see from the next slides, yeah, we have confirmed 227,000 cases and 32,000 of global deaths. So now, as you can see on the on the on the paragraph on the daily cases, it's dropping down. They're very pretty good, but uh, we still having like 200, 300, 400 deaths per day. 
So what happened is we are still counting the, the people that was uh, in the lockdown. Since the 4th of May, we began it for the, for the second phase. And uh, the, the phase two means that the border is still closed between the region. and uh, but, but the reopening of the facilities and the works uh, are getting, you know, um, getting opened very fast. And now what we faced was that even if a small amount of patients still uh, getting infected, we are not closing the borders. So, so next week, we are probably going to reopen the borders from different region. If the amount of the patients or the, or the, um, uh, of the people that got infected are pretty the same. What does that mean? If my region, which is Umbria, is, has the similar rates of infection of a border region, which is a close to mine, which is market, for example, we can reopen the borders. If my region is uh, close to, uh, to Tuscany, which still has a huge amount of, uh, of deaths, we cannot cross that border. So even in Italy, we are still in lockdown between borders. Um, what, what happened, I think that we have to assume that uh, places like Brazil that are getting very bad right now, they're facing the, the huge emergency. Uh, we have to think about those places. Uh, and I do think that it's the pandemic things is going on worldwide. We have to think globally, not like one place. Uh, so in order to reopen the border from different states, we have to think about reopening safely. And there's, I think that few things that we have to think when we are reopening the whole activities. Uh, um, Sampat, can I ask you if I can talk about my... But I, 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 it's on my mind as well. So I'm just going to quickly take you uh, to your section, to your slides next. That's okay. here. So okay. in order to, to tell you what happened in Italy, I will tell you what my story was. Yeah, these, are your, slides to... again. these are your slides. I mean, you can finish all of, all of your slides. Yeah, uh, what happened to me was uh, on, on the 12th of March, I suddenly became... Uh, without, I had a, a loss of smell and taste, so I was uh, aware about what happened to me. And then uh, the problem was that at, during that time, WHO and, uh, and the other guidelines was a reporting loss of smell and taste. So I wasn't a candidate for having a nasal swab, but I was wear, worried about my situation. I started to cover myself because I wasn't uh, uh, allowed to leave my work. So I started to cover myself, social distancing, try to put myself in a situation to avoid other spreading of myself or my virus because I was aware about that. So I decided after two or three days to have a, a blood test and the blood test was completely changed. Uh, I was in a field account, PCR, D-dimer, and stuff like that. So then I finally got a swab, and that confirmed my situation that was a positive. At that time, not every state was aware about loss of smell, even in some, some cases in China and in, in Iran. But no um, ENT surgeon was at that time um, affected by the disease. And I sent an email worldwide for, for my association, telling, the, the, telling my friends and the societies that you might face this emergency, you might face those situations. What I got was a loss of smell, then I got fever, then I got cough, so pneumonia, typical pneumonia and stuff like that. So as you can see from these slides, so this is the Italian Society of uh, Otolaryngology. After a while, we developed some kind of flow chart. The first slide in green is uh, how to access uh, in, uh, for a simple visit. The red slide is representing the surgical activities for during the pandemic season. That was before reopening on the phase two and the tracheostomy for COVID-19 patients. I think that the main thing that we have to, uh, that represent those slides are that surgical and consultation activity are, should be limited to vital emergency and oncology. We should, we, we, I think that we can a little bit change this uh, um, sentence, however, uh, by now, and uh, about those uh, guidelines from the Italian society, a block room is dedicated for SARS-CoV-2 points. Um, 
we decided also to have or build a crisis unit and the screening of patients before surgery. This is recommended. What we are recommending by now to reopening the surgical activity, even if for elective surgery, we put uh, patients for nasal swab two days prior to nasal of surgery, then the days of surgery. Uh, if for patients that are um, that are having positive uh, swab, we're recommending CT scan, uh, chest CT scan. Yeah, if um, I interrupt you, Puya, I just want this to be clarified. So you take a swab two days before the patient actually comes to the hospital, right? Yes, we we have uh, patients at home doing a nasal swab. We we assume that the patients should be in quarantine or stay at home two days prior to surgery, and the patients should stay two days at home and avoid uh, other contact with other people because otherwise everything will be just unnecessary. Not necessary. The days in which he will have the surgery, we will have another swab. And if it's everything is going to be fine, the patients will be allowed to have surgery. And if the patient is allowed to have surgery, there's a, a, a specific way and um, to be able to get from the uh, hospital and to reach to the OR. We will drop with that way, in that way, a huge uh, possibility to get a reinfection during the the home to the hospital and from the hospital into the OR. And uh, yeah, the, we will drop a lot the possibility of, uh, of any kind of infection. When we are in the OR, there's specific um, uh, flowchart that we have to use. We always have to use FFP2, not FFP3. We have to use uh, PPE, of course, uh, everything that we will it's, I think that worldwide right now is getting the same, by, but we also recently published uh, next last week uh, some guidelines for skull-based procedures uh, and, uh, and for uh, synonasal um, patients. I sent you the slides, right? You can find it on, that's the paper. It's not this one, it's, yeah, it's this one. This was our um, recommendation from, I've been a part of this IFOS group for a systematic review for sinus and anterior skull based surgery during this uh, 19 pandemic. We always uh, recommendation for before hospitalization, interoperative room, protect me personal equipment and for technical specificities and post-operative visits. That's the, that's the, that's the issue. The post-operative management of patients and selection of patients should be mandatory. Because if we open, open we put a, um, a cancer patient, the, the patient will be, you know, his body will have some kind of uh, depression for his immune response. So we are, we are putting a patient in a position where he will not be able to, uh, to reach the hospital for a future consultation. So we have to think and imagine that future consultations will be telemedicine or will be, you know, web-based consultation. But what about the breedments of synonasal cavities? What about patients that should be um, treated for cancer of their nose and sinuses? Those patients should be treated as well. So. In order to do it, we don't have to take in consideration the age of the patients, morbidity of the patients, and, uh, and also facilities of the patient. Because if the patient is coming, you've been for the um, group pathological for a while. There are patients coming from you from a different region. Those patients cannot be treated anymore. We cannot allow people to travel from 400 to 500 kilometers far away. So those patients cannot be treated. And, and not all the patients can be treated from different center, even in Italy. Italian community is not, you know, not all the hospitals are allowed or have the capability to treat those patients. So that's the big issue that we are facing right now. And so if, uh, in order okay, to- if I, if I may just interrupt you, 
so you're telling me that different uh, hospitals in different zones of Italy are not allowed to refer patients at this point of time between uh, each other. We are recommending that uh, possibly cancer patient, that means advanced uh, patients suffering from cancer diseases. I can tell from my opinion for and for our guidelines on sinuses and skull-based procedures, of course, and for the Italian community, those patients, severe patient will be treated. Uh, the problem is that how we can take care of those patients after the surgical procedure that will stay for three, four days, that will, uh, you know, um, dismiss, discharge, but those patients should come for a post-operative management. Some of, the, some of those patients cannot be treated. If we schedule a procedure for a patient that is living 400 kilometers far away, those patients are not candidate right now to move from a region to another region because after that, we cannot take care of those patients. So then we have to manage the post-operative care with those patients in the same region. So we also have to take care of the capability to interact with our colleagues from the other region, but they should be able to take care of this patient. And what if those, those colleagues are not you know, trained to take care of those patients? So selection is mandatory by now. Uh, one, uh, I know it's getting late for you, but just one last question. Now, Priya, uh, Italy, I, I've been in Italy, so Italy is uh, heavily reliant on, on the public health system, like uh, perhaps in the UK as well. So uh, now we know that public health system stick in COVID patients. That's how it's working in India. The government centers, the public uh, centers are the ones which are now, right now, at least in India, dealing with the COVID patients. The private centers are not uh, in the front line, I would say. So, but in Italy, since a lot of the system is public, how would you manage a cancer patient, for instance, with a COVID patient in another ward? Where are these segregated? Because we had one conversation, I remember, where you said, Sampath, it's important that you guys segregate your COVID patients from the other uh, uh, from other patients because that's where the maximum cross infection happens. We we have special hospital, dedicated hospital for COVID nineteen patients. In my region, in Uber region, right now we don't have any cases uh, hospitalized for a specific um, COVID nineteen problem. All those patients has been discharged, fortunately. During at that time, what we had was. Uh, uh, taking the private hospital uh, working with us to be able to um, share um, and, and try to disseminate different specialties all around. For example, a big hospital will be um, uh, rescheduled for different in different hospitals. And even for private hospital, those are allowed to, uh, how to say, um, facilitate the surgical procedure that has been previously scheduled in, in, in that hospital. So one COVID uh, hospital dedicated for patient that's suffering from COVID, uh, from, uh, from uh, COVID-19, but surgical procedure are not allowed in that, in that place. So any patients that has been declared COVID-19 patient, but has to be has to do um, surgical procedure. In those in those cases, another hospital will be allowed to uh, to proceed with those uh, uh, dedicated um, uh, room operative rooms. Uh, the main hospital wasn't uh, uh, wasn't able to um, proceed to do operation on those patients. Okay. And then um, my hospital also allowed to have people from abroad or from different hospital to perform surgeries because they weren't able at that time to perform surgeries because they were doing actually consultation, just consultation and, uh, and uh, um, office-based um, um, visit. 
Okay, just before you go, I'd like you to just briefly touch upon those critical days where all of you, you know, everybody was a COVID uh, uh, specialist and, uh, you know, I know that Casa de Cura where the group autologica is located and where I learned my, uh, did my fellowship in skull base surgery, that hospital in total was uh, uh, dedicated to COVID and almost all centers in Italy at one point where COVID centers and all of you, even if you were not pulmonologists or related uh, uh, to the frontline work, you were all pushed to the frontline. So how was that experience? Because uh, that's something I would like to extract out of you before you leave. Well, at the, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, that means fr from our point, so from February to until 20, 30 of March, there were, I can tell you my point of view because I stood uh, and worked until 19. Then I got, you know, uh, the conference swab. I was uh, in lockdown. The first 20 days was pretty scared because we there's there were no guidelines at that time. Um, the mandatory uh, for swab was just three. Um, Three, uh, three points, fever, more than 38, and then cough, and then fatigue. And many of the patients, unfortunately, weren't in that position. So we wasn't able to test those patients, and we also wasn't able to have the PPE at that time. Uh, the amount of patients that was coming in, in, a, in a clinic you know, ENT uh, procedures or patients uh, were coming in mass, uh, where tons of people coming in in, uh, in, uh, in the hospital. The hospital was not closed at that time. We were facing people coming, and uh, um, also some of the patients uh, wasn't uh, wasn't tested. So the highest number that we faced between the the first March and twenty of March was probably COVID-19 patients and and those patients wasn't wasn't able to be tested even and we were and we were just able to tell them you had to stay in quarantine. So many people were at that time, you know, uh, hungry, hungry or mad at us because we weren't able to tell them you have to stay home because you're probably uh, infected. They were mad, and at the same time, weren't able to stay at home. After 18, I guess, 18 of March, the lockdown completely shut down the Italian community. Before that, we, we were able to, you know, travel around and spread the disease. Okay, so, yeah. But uh, fortunately, after, four, I think, 4th of May, the WHO recognized loss of smell and taste as one of the of the symptoms. So my yeah. fatigue finally got to a point that is approved worldwide. Of course. Yeah. So for those uh, of you listening to us, uh, uh, one of the first few doctors uh, uh, who identified loss of smell and loss of taste as, as uh, one of the first um, uh, symptoms in an in a otherwise asymptomatic uh, patient was uh, uh, Dr. Puya Degani, who's here with us. and. Uh, his battles in the front line was what led him to contract the disease and he's come out of it. And uh, yeah, so uh, things went well for him. So uh, thanks, Puya. So I know you'll have to leave. You have another webinar. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really, really sorry. So thank you, Sampat. And thank you. I hope that everyone will have a great meeting. Uh, I will see that. So goodbye, uh, Chang. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. I like, uh, Puya. goodbye. All, all of us, Puya. Stay safe. I'll see you very soon. Thank Please. you so much. Puya. Puya, Puya, I think Subhash has a question. Subhash, uh, did you want yeah. to Yeah, Dr. Puya, uh, great uh, talk and good contribution to medical knowledge regarding coronavirus affecting all factory epithelium. I just wanted to ask you, um, with such a, a huge uh, effect on Italy and uh, its healthcare workers, uh, some percentage of them probably suffering from moral distress. Um, the how how you guys are keeping up your resilience and moral distress under control? How you guys are doing it? Because there are no pubs, no coffee shops. <laughs> uh, 
I think that I, I, I have to be honest. What we are going to face in the future is going to be a, mm, mental issues. This is, this is the, the, the things that I'm facing right now. The rates of depression, anxiety, and fatigue that people are going to face are going to be the main issues in, in the next future. And I'm not talking about one, one year. Probably anxiety and depression. I, I felt depression after I, I got outside of home and got back to work because I, I was suffering from that. And, uh, and getting back at work and seeing that people are still, not, are still underestimating this disease is frustrating. So the use, the use of, uh, I think that we, we've been blessed because of the internet and the web. Uh, we, we got in a, in a position where we can spread our information in a second. But at the same time, you are, you know, getting an, a huge amount of information, which are fake news, unfortunately. Uh, mm -hmm. Media are spreading huge amount of uh, fake news and, and also information not necessary politically, uh, economically, and, uh, and also scientifically. And that's, the, that's the, the worst scenario. What we are going to face is depression. And you, you are going to talk about this at the end of the, of the talk, by the way. But what we are seeing right now is that the people after the, after the first phase where was, you know, aware of the, of the, of the science, uh, now everybody's talking about uh, economics. Uh, they don't care about other stuff. So we always don't have to, we don't have to forgive what happened before in order to get better in the future. Because if we are just focusing on economic right now, we are, we are, we are going to forget what happened before, we are going to face uh, a bad things in the future. So uh, uh, we, we cannot use uh, anything that you, <laughs> that you said, by the way. Um, but I know a huge amount of, uh, of, uh, of our colleagues that are using antidepressive and, uh, and, and facing huge mental health problems. I, I just can't imagine uh, an Italian not having uh, a coffee, you know, in a bar five times a day or maybe a glass of wine in the evening, uh, you know, so socializing. So it must be really hard you know, for, uh, for culturally, you know, so it's, it's not just the disease that gets into your system, into the physique, but also culturally in the mind, you know, for your such uh, lovely people uh, who are so, uh, you know, so so friendly. Uh, it must be really, really hard. I can understand. We are so. You know, yeah. Last point that I would like to tell everyone: having a COVID nineteen, being a COVID nineteen patient, puts you a stigma. We have to to tell the people that there's no stigma in it. Yeah. You don't have to be scared. That you have to tell the people that you've been affected because if you just recognize that you've been affected, you might, you know, tell the people, don't, don't get in close in contact to me or I have to stay in quarantine and I'm not afraid of my situation. That will put, you, put the people in, in a position, you know, privacy and stuff like that. Health come first. If you're, if you're admitting that you're suffering from something, and then you might recover very well. You put others in, in a position to, to be aware about that and take responsibility for your situation and other situation. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Thanks well, a lot. Well put it, uh, Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you yeah, so much, yeah. everyone. I have to go. I, I have to leave. Love you all. Thank you. Same here. Love you too. Thanks. All the best. Take care. Ciao. Stay Ciao. safe. Ciao. 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 Bye. Okay, Sarun, uh, we'll take this forward with you uh, leading us from here. So these are your slides. Would you like to say something? Yes. So first of all, Sambat, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very interesting discussion. I feel very honored. And uh, I see many friends as well, Subhash and Vaitsi, you know, um, and yourself, obviously. So it almost feels like a friendly discussion among a group of friends, like I said yesterday. So... Um, as you know, we are actually in the UK, we are in the middle of a pandemic and um, the, the, we are not sure whether the, the worst is over or not. And uh, we have been in lockdown since uh, the middle of March. And um, 
what was happening was you know in the initially what happens is the end of december during christmas time is you started seeing all this biblical scenes of lockdown and things happening in china mm. and um, it's almost like another world and uh, nobody would believe that uh, these are all real mm. and you know we didn't know what was go- going on so i don't think rest of the world as a whole took any notice of these things and the flights continued and everything was continuing as if there's nothing happening then what happened this in january you know people were getting desperate in um, in other parts of china and slowly there was a bit of a panic but even in february nothing was happening i was invited to a wonderful meeting in sri lanka so i went to india on 14th of february i know the date exactly because um, valentines day and you know um, we had to spend it in the airport so at that time there was uh, when i went to the airport and all there's no checks being done and nothing was happening when i landed in india no checks nobody asked any questions and i, I was very true and i saw people wearing masks here and there very rarely but i got back here on uh, the 24th of february and then gradually people started panicking and we we started seeing the horror you know the the worst images from coming from italy and uh, that actually was a, a waking sort of wake up call for the uk and uh, we we knew that it is coming and it's not going to be long so the first experience that we had in our department was one of our junior doctors he went to see um, another expert to operate uh, in liverpool and he came back uh, what he didn't know was the other expert went to italy for skiing and he oh. just returned and there was no problem and he was absolutely fine so he went to operate and within a few days we got the message saying that the other surgeon is now covid positive and so our trainee had to um, do testing and uh, in the middle of that he came to our department as well so everybody had to get testing he was tested positive the trainee but the there are five other doctors some of them were symptomatic but this is where the flaw comes to the testing they were all tested negative even though they had um, cough and the symptoms so the test was negative and um, but that was the first wake up call but you can see that um, in the in the graph there's not many thing happening um, in the first two weeks of march but we knew that things were coming so i did my last full day of operating on 17th of march i did the and there they were operating and uh, with no pp or nothing uh, mastoids and i was happily doing everything and you know with a lot of aerosol generation and then but within two days we went to lockdown but i was asked to do the clinics for two more days what i didn't know at that time was ent surgeons were actually in the forefront of all of these things and we are actually going to bear the brunt because we are doing aerosol generating procedures and flexible endoscopies and we we don't even know that uh, this is a problem because the virus harbors in the nose and the nasopharynx and even if the patient is not coughing if you if you are doing an endoscopy you know that you're going to ask him to speak and so that to check the vocal cords when you do that even the speech can actually produce aerosolization that is the research that we know now so luckily what happened is you know our department took action and uh, on 18th of um, march we stopped decided to stop all elective operating and the clinic stopped the next day as well but you can see from this graph that uh, the death started happening very slowly but we were told that you know, we were two weeks before italy uh, behind italy that was the truth so it's kept on increasing and uh, it the worst day was somewhere here when uh, quite a lot of people you know have got infected and uh, there was a lot of problem but you can see that the, the total deaths is now more than 35000 and uh, the problem is now uk has got the biggest death rate in whole of europe and uh, it's uh, confirmed cases england has had the maximum and scotland we had uh, the population of scotland is only 5 and 1/2 million less than that of hong kong i think but in a huge area so our death rate is not that as much as in london for example but the problem here is that uh, we noticed that you know the some of the deaths were happening in care homes i don't know about um, you whether you guys know here um, there are care homes and that's basically for people with uh, elderly people 
usually above the age of 80 with the dementia and who can't look after themselves and whether their kids or somebody is not able to look after them. So they are very reluctantly in Scotland, at least they, nobody goes to care home with any happiness. And uh, they are full of people with, um, you know, dementia and they are not able to look after. And the deaths were happening in um, quite a lot of in care homes as well. So you can see in the bottom, the death rate in England is, uh, that is two days ago, 31,000. And in Scotland, uh, 2,134. But now we started adding the deaths from the, the care homes as well, which is adding another uh, dimension. And uh, can I have the next slide, please? So you can see the death rates, uh, the daily additional death rates from COVID. It started very slowly. And then suddenly there is a huge surge and mainly in London and neighboring areas. Whereas we, we were two weeks behind um, in Scotland. So what happened is, you know, uh, I don't think any of the ANEs or the, the ITUs became overwhelmed. We were able to do the, um, everybody who needed ITU care was admitted, but there is uh, some of the, for example, uh, people with other comorbidities who are dementia and over the age of 80, and um, they decided not to, if you decide not to do sort of resuscitate, then they are not going to be admitted to the hospital essentially because we are not going to do anything. So the death rates are gradually coming down, but I don't think it is the end of the story. But you can see, if you look at this graph from the right hand side, the death rate follows a specific pattern, okay? The problem here is that uh, there is uh, nothing happening up until you reach 50 and then gradually it increasing. And, after the age of 80, uh, it is a huge hit. And uh, the, the chart shows that the men has got a higher death rate than the women. The yellow is the men and the, the dark blue is the, the women. And uh, you can see a light blue column as well. I was not sure why that was, but it just means that you know the sex has not been recorded or in, in the UK, you don't have to declare you know, what you are by legality. So, uh, the, it's just because you know that has not been declared. So the problem, the, the take home story is that don't be complacent just because it is all happening somewhere and nothing is happening in your country. It doesn't mean that uh, it's not going to come to you. And uh, the similar population is the problem and you are going to get quite of, uh, inundated with the, this kind of problems. And the second take home message is that we, we thought that we can control all this by hand washing and even on the first, second weekend in, in March, I, am, I have booked a show, The Lion King in Edinburgh and you know, I, I didn't want to go, but the company said that you know, they're not going to refund your money because the government is saying you can still go. So reluctantly I went there and you know, I was terrified all of the time whether anybody is coughing and you know, that was the last outing we had. But I think the, the, the other lesson is that you know, the the PPE and uh, the hand washing and uh, the masks. The, I don't think in the UK, the government has advised everybody should wear masks when you're going out. But in Scotland, at least they have declared that if you are going to shops or where you cannot maintain the social distancing within two meters, it's almost impossible. Uh, then you have to, it's better to wear a mask and make sure that you have the, you know, uh, all the hand hygiene and all those things. So. Uh, I will talk about the precautions for inpatient outpatient when it comes to that. Is that okay, Sambat? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Before uh, uh, you leave, can you please tell us what was the strategical difference between the UK policy, which initially uh, uh, banked on the herd immunity concept and then, you know, with the uh, backtrack versus Sweden, which went in for uh, no restrictions, self-restraint as they call it. But eventually, when I, I, what I understand is that Sweden's uh, death rate. I mean, uh, the the uh, the total death rate is still much higher than other countries when it comes to Sweden. Even if the number of deaths are low. So, what's your take on this? And what exactly happened there? I think if you you know you saw the graph, the death affects you know the the. It's not only the age. I had another uh, look at the the data, and the the maximum number of deaths happened in people with uh, elderly people with dementia. That was the number one category. The second highest was uh, people with other risk factors such as, you know, COPD and uh, uh, hypertension, for example. They are the groups and the diabetes. So comorbidity with age is a bad combination. So anybody with comorbidities, 
is a and they, when they're older that's a problem but other strange thing that we noticed in the uk is that you know that uh, the the chance of dying from covid is two times that of a normal population if you are a, 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 if you belong to the black african or uh, afro caribbean group and uh, amongst the asians itself there is a difference uh, it's in the slides that is coming but uh, the deaths from covid or severe infection is much higher uh, if you belong to a pakistani or bangladeshi um, person as opposed to indian but of course the indians have got about 1.4 times more uh, chance of dying when compared to the normal uh, local population we don't know what these differences are i think as you say whether the the chance the reason why the lockdown is introduced is not to prevent the deaths okay not entirely it is in it is to prevent the situation where uh, you know the patients are coming and you don't have hospital beds or itu beds and uh, those people who could have been saved are not going to be saved because of lack of capacity in the hospitals i'm pleased to say that that did not happen in the uk you know that uh, we created a brand new hospital in london um, with itu facilities uh, in one of the conference centers even in glasgow our conference center is now converted into a, a makeshift hospital with uh, about 500 beds but it is not been needed and what we did in our hospital was we stopped all operating and the ventilators are situated not only in the itu but in the theaters as well as the recovery rooms so we automatically doubled or tripled our capacity with itu because just by in case of a problem we could have used all the theaters as uh, itu beds but that was not needed and so to answer your question lightly i think the the herd immunity concept initially thought of by the government had to be revised because the chance uh, when started uh, people started getting more and more infection and uh, the deaths became increased we had to immediately change our strategy because if you don't do it then you will become overwhelmed with the, the hospital admissions perfect perfect right uh, thanks arun we'll come back to you and um, uh, dr subhash sanashet team so uh, these are your slides would you like to take us through some of your slides yeah thank you sampath for organizing this and inviting me as well among uh, all our other panelists um uh, as i mentioned to arun that he will meticulously go through everything so i don't have to talk much he did the same <laughs> so we got hit but we responded very well in new zealand um we were preparing for a annual memorial event uh which happened a year ago i ozi came to christchurch took the machine gun and killed 52 uh, uh, muslim brothers in a, in a mosque that became world famous and we were uh mourning that for a year um and then we were re getting ready for a anniversary of that memorial event but um, who at the same time declared pandemic nature of coronavirus and um, so we cancelled that program and got into get uh, a action against covid what uh, we did was um unite all the people against covid rather than uh, wage a war against the covid so people were united so we got quite a lot of uh, buy in from the people you look at the statistics there new zealand uh, uh, only 1504 infected patients with the 21 to 28 deaths almost everybody everybody who died was more than 60 years old or had comorbid conditions or in residential care facilities as arun was talking about similar to that kind of stuff so you can say of course new zealand is a small country um geographically isolated and it's easy to seal the border and population is less than a new york population or a scotland population around 4.7 million and uh, um but which all played the role when the virus broke out but its relative success when it says it's uh, amongst the lowest uh, per capita infection rate in the world 
So a lot of things contributed to that as a nation. If you go to the next slide. So what happened? We sealed the border very early, earliest among all the countries, we saw, sealed our border with the high quality quarantine facilities for the people are coming in at that time. No jets in, no jets out. So, and also Ministry of Health came in so fast for a rapid case detection, identified with widespread testing, widespread. So schools, grounds, rugby places, McDonald's, KFC, everything turned out to be a drive-in test center. So the test positive within 48 hours were engaged with the rapid isolation and swift contact tracing with the public health people. They mobilized almost all, all, all army kind of stuff. And intensive hand hygiene um, education in the hospital, in the public, and in supermarkets and everywhere. And uh, um, intense physical distancing. In fact, public compliance is so high, we don't have any positive cases in the last one week. Nobody died in the last couple of days. And um, despite of uh, so many tests are conducted, 1,500 1, plus positive cases. But the most important step is this lady, the prime minister, she gave a very empathetic message along with the science. This Ashley Bloomfield, one of our public health doctor, is the director general of medicine there. These two people fronted up to the public, to the press every day at one o'clock. So we stopped our work, listened to this lady and listened to this doctor. When you listen to only politicians, it doesn't work. You need to bring in scientists, scientific people. That's what South Korea did. Only the scientific people spoke to people uh, in television. However, this well-coordinated communication strategies, good testing, and the public health measures really turned the whole thing around for New Zealand, and also early sealing of the border. So I feel um, quite lucky to be here because all of, if it was hit very badly, our health resources are not enough to even to take 10% of care of those patients. We were hit very mildly and very swiftly coronavirus went out, but still not out of danger because when you say it's gone, you need to really wait for 14 to 20 days before you say country is free of Corona. And public health, people have put the public health in first, but New Zealand economy has really, really suffered because economy is all because of the travel, tourism, and uh, export and import, uh, export market basically of agriculture and uh, the farm products. So it's going to have a big impact on us. It's a recession hitting here. Uh, but public health is restored and there is an election. Actually, this lady has done very well going to be re-elected again, possibly. That is the story from Down Under. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, uh, Subhash, so um, I know that there is a huge Chinese uh, immigrant population in New Zealand. I mean, uh, uh, very, very significant. So yeah, the, the lockdown in terms of uh, shutting down the flights and all must have happened really early, much and I, I, I think uh, you guys acted much faster than many other countries, uh, including Italy and uh, many of the European countries, because uh, the, the to and fro from China is quite uh, frequent, if, I, if I'm not wrong. You're right. And um, um, New Zealand that depends on um, all its exports, billions of dollars worth uh, meat and milk and all the other products to China. Mm -hmm. But what, what the government did was, they never stopped cargo ships and cargo planes. Mm -hmm. So supermarkets are open and uh, the things were coming into the country and things were going out of the country as well. But they, they the ships are all uh, stopped in Chinese ports probably, but mm -hmm. still they went out of the country. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Really. So uh, have you technically... Uh, has the government officially declared the country COVID free? I mean, you, you just mentioned that it's been one week uh, since any no. new cases. 
no no we went on uh, multiple levels mm -hmm. level 4 to level 1 level 4 is complete lockdown which mm -hmm. is uh, um, uh, you can't move around you can't go meet anyone you have to have a physical distancing you can't have anyone coming home everything is closed only essential healthcare workers or essential workers can go and come about with the special permission mm -hmm. that's level 4 now we are in level 2 which is we can go to the market, malls are open, uh, we can go from region to region uh, and uh, um, uh, almost uh, restaurants are uh, with strict control actually because the fine what they are imposing for non-compliance is very high. Sure. And, um, and also uh, public here, their compliance is very high actually. Almost 90% okay. of them followed what government was saying empathetically. Mm -hmm. That's why my slide shows, uh, if you go back to one slide there, in the road, uh, in the road, uh, not this one, next slide, in the road, it says, be kind and be safe. So empathetic message rather than a punitive message went in and the people grabbed it. So. Oh. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna come back to you in a while. So we'll go to go uh, uh, ahead with uh, Chetan. Uh, my dear friend from um, uh, Abu Dhabi. So Chetan, tell us about what happened in uh, in the Middle East. I mean, you'll have to tell us uh, the story of the whole of the Middle East because you represent uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, the entire geographical territory, not just uh, the UAE, but uh, yes, primarily from your country. But what's the situation there? How did things turn out uh, and how, how are they shaping up? Uh, as you know, uh... Dubai and Abu Dhabi airports are the busiest. So when the Chinese uh, Lunar uh, New Year uh, celebrations were on, a lot of tourists uh, traveled uh, from China to all around the world transiting through Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So that is the reason possibly uh, we have a lot of cases now. Uh, UAE otherwise is, is a country where you have citizens uh, from say 200 nationalities staying here together. So we have all sorts of people, uh, like Subhash was saying, uh, people from New Zealand are very compliant to all the instructions and uh, all the advisories. So you have uh, people from New Zealand, you have people from the subcontinent who may be compliant to some advisories, some, some of them who don't follow advisories. So you have varied kind of population and uh, uh, with UAE, there is a particular uh, thing, whether uh, it's anything, uh, any situation, they always try to be positive, And that's how the media is here as well. So uh, when we had the first case here, uh, maybe around 29th uh, January, so you don't see many elaborate slides here because I don't want to go into the full details of how it shaped up and, uh, you know, I don't want to say anything negative because that is the UAE policy. So uh, as of now, we have something around uh, 25,000 uh, confirmed cases and uh, about 14,000 active. Uh, and uh, the data is shared on day-to-day -day basis as to how many new cases have been declared and uh, how many recoveries. So as of now, uh, the recoveries are more than the number of cases and UAE has been testing very, very elaborately. And uh, the mission is to test almost every single citizen our president staying in the UAE. So since we are testing a lot, we are getting a lot of new cases, but at the same time, the recoveries in UAE are getting better by each and uh, each day. And as far as the rest of the Middle East is concerned, I think uh, uh, you won't get much of a data, like most of, most of the data that comes out is pretty restricted. So uh, in Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, parts of uh, Qatar, Oman, Kuwait, and Bahrain, there have been a lot of cases, but I'm afraid I will not be able to get you the exact uh, uh, number of cases. So uh, 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 UAE being a, uh, a country predominantly relying on, uh, uh, you know, expats and people coming from outside, as you said, I think the city of Dubai have very popularly, you know, there are close to 200 nationalities of uh, people from 200 nationalities in Dubai So and Abu Dhabi. So these countries... Uh, must be facing a real financial crunch as well. And we'll come and we'll talk about it a little later, but uh, I think uh, 
it must be really difficult um, uh, it must be a really difficult predicament for for the country which relies so heavily on an expatriation yes, yes. right very true very true most of the income is from tourism and uh, uh, oil oil sector so like i told you sampath i mean uh, here it's uh, i mean if you live here you will understand that even despite all this economic crisis and this and that if you just open the newspaper every day hey there will be just positive messages that will get through this i mean this is this won't last long and uh, you know some of they try to motivate everyone here that you know some of will get to this first and then we look at the other thing so that's how it is uh, in the uae and um, this this country being governed by uh, a council of uh, ministers chosen uh, by the royalty and uh, every dictate is from the uh, royalty so whatever uh, decision is taken is implemented in full spirit so uh, that's how it is sampat i mean basically we are now looking at getting through this right now and uh, there is a lot of support from the government in terms of uh, like where i work it's a very small hospital with, and we don't have a resident intensivist so what happens is uh, if we get cases and they get critical uh, there is a online support on how to manage the cases and as and when you have uh, beds available in uh, higher referral centers these patients are referred so uh, the government make sure that everybody is taken care of and uh, like uh, subhash was saying the fines for any uh, non compliance to any of the directions is very huge i mean uh, it runs uh, in in lakhs of rupees for a for a single uh, uh, non compliance so people are very careful and uh, there is a partial lockdown here and people do follow that and uh, slowly i think we are getting a grip of the situation and uh, like uh, the skies have opened up uh, because there are a lot of expats uh, staying in other countries who want to come back here so as and when more people come in they we may have a lot of more positive cases so it's a very dynamic situation we can't say which way it will go but uh, surely uh, like i told you that uh, there is a lot of positivity in whatever happens and uh, government tries to be as supportive as possible uh ue is an, is completely on the other end of the spectrum when it comes to public health care you know a lot of hospitals are private and uh, uh in comparison with uh, the country like let's say uk or italy how how the how do you manage i mean uh, are there dedicated po- uh, hospitals are private hospitals asked to give beds off to uh, most of uh, the hospitals here are private hospitals the mm-hmm. government hospitals uh, are very less in number and uh, in in the hospitals also you have varies uh, varied uh, levels like uh, ours is a very small hospital which has a intensive care unit uh, manned by anesthetists and physicians and you have referral center which are very well equipped uh, initially there were uh, a few hospital which, which were marked as covid hospitals but now there are so many cases that almost every hospital you know has to take in a lot of uh, covid patients and uh, like i told you there is expertise available online for consultation and uh, if there are critical cases uh, we try to transfer them as soon as possible to uh, better centers so and uh, the it, government it also could be private centers as well it could be one of the and and yes. one of the bigger ho- private hospitals also isn't it yes 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 and the government has set up field hospitals to you know uh, cater for those mild and uh, asymptomatic cases who need to be quarantined so uh, they are trying to do their best okay 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 so thank you we'll come to you, uh, later chetan so i'll uh, go right. through for my slides so the situation in india is a little bit of everything that all of you have said uh, we uh, we are fairly okay i would wouldn't say you know uh, we are somewhere in the middle of the spectrum we uh, began slowly but i think the peak is uh, uh, in our phase now we have uh, had um, uh, 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 100000 cases 118000 cases uh, 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 and about 3500 deaths if you look at the uh overall uh, positivity rate now that's 3.8% which is very low now testing in india there's a lot of debate regarding testing in india and a lot of uh, western uh, media uh, attributed the low death rates in india and the low uh, uh, case load in india to uh, low uh, levels of testing which is true 
But then uh, we also know that a lot of countries uh, in the West as well did not test everybody. So we uh, uh, now the, we had a, a lockdown that was uh, uh, put into place very early, fairly early, I would say. I'm not sure as early as New Zealand, but fairly early, uh, much uh, before the, uh, uh, the, uh, the European countries. And now what that did was that it helped us buy time. <clears throat> Uh, India is a huge country, one of the <clears throat> most populated countries after China, 1.35 billion people. So uh, whatever you do would fall short. You know, the government uh, was uh, would have been in a no-win situation right from the beginning of the pandemic. So I think, you know, if I were to study the government's mind, I would say that they initiated the lockdown much before a, a lot of countries expected India to, uh, 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 or many of us would have expected the country to go for a lockdown only because the government wanted to buy time for any, for to do anything, you know, so to build up uh, more testing centers, to formulate a policy. So it was smart on the government's um, uh, uh, policy makers to initiate a lockdown and then think about what's going to happen. So with the lockdown in place, we are uh, preventing uh, the spread from happening, but at the same time, policymakers can sit and think and implement whatever they uh, they were thinking. So, if you look at Bangalore, we have 276 cases, 140 deaths, fairly low for a city with a 12 to 15 million population. My state itself, uh, we have about 1,625 cases, just about 41 deaths. But I I, I can also uh, say to some so, some degree of certainty that this is probably also because we are not testing enough. Now in India, we have tested uh, 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 2.5 million people, 25 lakhs for the Indian uh, uh, audiences who are watching us. Uh, that's a lot of people when compared to any other country. But uh, then again, uh, if you look at uh, the, um, uh, the rate of the testing per million, uh, as they would call it, that's still very low at about 2000 tests per million which is much lower than many of the Western countries, which is badly affected by the pandemic, which stands at close to 5,000, uh, between 5,000 and 6,000 tests per million. Uh, so, but when I did a, a webinar on um, COVID on the 1st of May, uh, which was hosted by Ravi Sami from the US, and I was a panelist, this number was in, in the 400s. Now we have, during the interim, during the period of the lockdown, increased our testing capacity to close to 2,000 per million. And I'm sure we need to get to 5,000 to 6,000 to really study or know our numbers. You know, so I think that if India is declaring that it's got a, a 100,000 cases or 150,000 cases with about 3,500 deaths, the numbers are much higher, possibly three to four times that number. And um, uh, and, and, uh, and that wouldn't be surprising. Now, is, the, is India in phase two or three? We really don't know. Now, when the government began with the lockdown uh, 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 and, the, and the numbers were low when I mean, compared to a lot of Western countries, this was attributed to be a success um, uh, to the, uh, with regard to the government policy. Now, different states are, are ruled by different political parties. Now, the, uh, the government in the center doesn't rule all the states. A few of the states in India, uh, many of the states in India are ruled by the opposition as well. Now, this led to a kind of a competition because the blame game goes on. <clears throat> when there's politics, the blame game goes on, whether it's COVID or whether it is anything else. So the states were pitched against each other. So when the states are pitched against each other, every state tries to show good numbers. Now, uh, 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 so, um, uh, 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 so uh, uh, for instance, when uh, in my practice uh, in a hospital, uh, I would not be able to get everybody tested, everybody that I want tested, the, the system slows it down to an extent, you know? So if I, uh, of course, we, we don't take in patients with, um, uh, who have fever and we're gonna to come to that later. But if I were to get myself tested, for instance, I wouldn't be allowed, you know? So the, the samples have to be sent in a way where uh, the most uh, liable or the most uh, suspected pa uh, patients are, uh, are uh, tested and the rest of them are dismissed, frankly dismissed. So uh, uh, it's really difficult for us to know our real numbers. And hence, it's also difficult to know whether we're in phase two or three. 
phase two is when uh, <clears throat> when there is no community transmission and phase three is when there is community transmission. But the data that we've been seeing the last four or five days clearly shows that we must be in a uh, community transmission phase because we are looking at uh, 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 hitting 5,000, 6,000 cases a day now, which was not the case. We were, we were uh, like, you know, doing 1,000, 2,000 cases every day, but now we are hitting close to five, 6,000 cases a day. And I'm sure there must be, but the government has not declared that it's in phase three. The, there are many reasons to this because if you declare that you're in phase three, you also say that uh, your lockdown has not really contained the disease. Now that's a political uh, uh, statement again. Uh, but I think we'll have to be realistic and, and assume that the lockdown was smart only in terms of buying us time, uh, but not in terms of completely containing the disease and we must uh, look for the worst to come soon. So that's, um, uh, uh, how it is. So these are numbers, uh, the, uh, the nationwide lockdown, which was one of the biggest lockdowns that the world has seen, putting 1.35 billion people into lockdown is not easy. Even in China, uh, close to 70, 80 million people, uh, uh, 700, 800 million people are put in lockdown. The whole country did not go into lockdown at once. This was for the first time uh, a country of this size was put into a lockdown. It has, um, it there were a lot of ramifications and we are not going to talk about all of it, probably touch on a couple of issues. But you see here that uh, we began with 633 cases. Now we are at uh, 100,000 cases uh, during the period of the lockdown. Now, to the government's credit, the doubling rate has uh, reduced from uh, uh, three days to about 10 or 11 days during the lockdown. So that essentially means that we bought ourselves time to prepare ourselves for the eventuality. Again, if you look at the test per million, we are we are around uh, uh, 2,000, but that's only in the bigger states. If you see some of the smaller states like Haryana uh, have, uh, okay, so the Haryana has 2,900, which is uh, good, but you see that some of the states here uh, have uh, like, like Mizoram, it's a very small state. The test per million is hardly uh, uh, 250 uh, per million, which is not good, you know, so, uh, uh, so if you look at this one small state, Andaman and Nicobar Islands has a test per million uh, a ratio of 16,000. That's huge. No other state has been able to achieve those numbers. And I believe that increasing uh, the testing capacity and building up our testing capacity is the only way. Uh, and I think that's a message from everybody here. I think all the other countries that have done well have managed to control the disease. Uh, and uh, like Arun says, we are two weeks or maybe three weeks behind a few of those countries. I think we can learn from uh, some of the countries, increase the testing capacity, and, and that's how um, you would, uh, would eventually wriggle your way out. So as I told you, uh, India uh, is the biggest lockdown in the history of uh, you know uh, whatever. So here you see uh, uh, 1.3 billion people were put into a lockdown. The, the Chinese themselves have not had such a big lockdown. And um, that led to a lot of problems in India. The lockdown was sudden. It could not, uh, you know, you couldn't announce it a week before, but because by then uh, that would lead to an exodus. So people would go back and then that would lead to chaos. We needed people to be put, uh, uh, stay put wherever, wherever, wherever they are. We didn't want people to move. So the announcement came very suddenly. Uh, the Prime Minister was criticized for that announcement, but I think that there was a plan to it. The migrant uh, workers scenario blew up in our face. Uh, 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 so in India, for those of uh, the audience who are from outside India, uh, it's a huge country, so people tend to migrate from one state to another, especially from the rural areas into the, uh, into the cities. And when the lockdown happened, these are at the very low end of the economic ladder, and these uh, many of uh, these people, or practically all of them, uh, lived by earning wages by the day. So when uh, the lockdown happened, all the establishments were closed, business shut down, and these poorest of the poor, as, as I would call it, uh, were most affected. They uh, did not know where their next day's income, not the next month's income, but the next day's income was coming from. And now they were left in a situation where they did not have income, they were in practically foreign territory because in India things can get very diverse even with just 500 kilometers. So when you move from 
let's say a state uh, like uh, Bihar to Karnataka, that, that's practically hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. So when that happens, you're in a strange area, you don't have societal support and uh, you don't have money to uh, feed yourself. So a lot of these migrant workers wanted to go back to their homes, to their cities, to their towns, to their villages uh, in their respective states. And that led to huge crisis and we're still grappling with this. Uh, but uh, thankfully the lockdown is now over and uh, we have opened up uh, uh, many of our um, uh, different areas like uh, how Subhash said from grade four, if we were to grade our lockdown, we would also be in, in the same situation from a grade four complete total lockdown to a grade two. So uh, this slide shows that uh, India was uh, rated as one of the strictest uh, response to the corona pandemic hitting 100 uh, in, in practically one shot. You see this steep rise without any knowledge whatsoever, we, without any uh, uh, warning whatsoever, we, we, the lockdown was implemented going right up to the, the severest or, or the most um, uh, intense form of lockdown stringency index uh, was 100 and we hit there right in the beginning and we've kind of stayed there. Now we have eased uh, 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 the restrictions down a little bit. It helped in flattening the curve. There was a big debate. Was it actually flattening the curve? Has India begun flattening? But that's for another day to uh, uh, speak upon and uh, we wouldn't want to discuss because here we are, uh, we are here to primarily talk about the clinical aspects of, of um, how to deal with this uh, whole thing. Um, again, I come to the point of uh, ramping up test capacities. Uh, now in India, we have our own um, testing systems and we are constantly trying to innovate to somehow subsidize, cheapen the whole process, make it simpler uh, without really compromising with the, with the standards of testing. So uh, as in other countries, the um, RT-PCR uh, is what is uh, done, but there is something called the dry swabbing extraction free technique that's been developed, which will bring down the cost and will bring down the uh, duration of uh, uh, coming out with the, uh, with, with the, with the results, uh, which will hopefully uh, help us in our fight uh, against uh, this pandemic. So that's um, uh, that's me there in my uh, costume, I, as I would call it, uh, during one of my cases uh, recently. Uh, uh, and I was really, I should say that I was happy to operate once again after a good two months. It was a thrill, you know, despite uh, all, all this paraphernalia that uh, one had to go, go through. I'm sure that's the same with all of you. So I have a few uh, issues here that to touch upon, but I think uh, for the, um, um, lack of time, I'll just briefly go through this. So the availability of PPE also is a problem. We are not really distressed at this point of time, but I see the pandemic coming. My personal prediction is that we'll hit a million cases. Uh, and I think uh, for uh, the Zydus guys who are coming up with a poll, you can go ahead and uh, go ahead with the first couple of poll questions in quick su succession uh, as I go through some of these slides. So we are not yet in a crisis for PPE, but when the epidemic uh, or the pandemic blows in your face, I'm sure India will have problems. So we must ramp up our PPE uh, generating capacity. There's an interesting story here. India was not, practically did not have a single unit manufacturing PPE. We were import, net importers of P PPE. But today I was, I read uh, uh, in uh, somewhere in the news that we are now one among the top three or four PPE manufacturers in the world. So we've turned it around. So that's another positive that comes out from the lockdown. We bought ourselves time and that's that's very important. A couple of these issues we will be discussing uh, in, uh, in, in, the few, in the slides uh, to come. Uh, again, um, what are the economic uh, 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 fallouts of uh, the lockdown? This needs to be debated. We all know that markets have crashed and uh, almost the entire world is in a recession, how this, so these are all some of the challenges that um, I thought I'll, uh, I'll touch upon before we get into the clinical aspects. International travel uh, has come down drastically. I'm, uh, you know, I have patients, uh, being a skull-based surgeon, I get a lot of my patients from outside Bangalore. A lot of them are very apprehensive about coming down. A couple of patients, I remember a patient with a temporal bone carcinoma who, uh, who had his visa ready. He was just about to 
take take his flight the next day, and that is when the lockdown was announced, and this patient could not make it, and we advise chemotherapy, chemo radiation. I don't know what's what's the fate of this patient. So it's really affected uh, all of us, and uh, uh, it's it's going to be it's going to stay like this for some time. Um, it no longer pays to be a computer or a internet or a gizmo dud. You know you. You can't say, I don't know Zoom, I don't know internet, I'm not going to check my mails. So that's not good because the future is uh, is to be online, you know, and um, uh, we we need to gear ourselves. Whoever says, uh, you know, has an allergy uh, towards uh, the gizmos, uh, I think uh, will have to retire, uh, frankly, you know, retire from clinical practice. You, you, you no longer, uh, our websites are all, I had websites before, so uh, now we have enabled all of uh, these with um, online consultations. When you en enable your websites, your personal websites or your university websites with online consultation, especially for the private practitioners out there, I think you all have to have websites uh, yourself. The university provides websites and they have uh, what is called the, uh, uh, the, uh, the payment gateways that attach to it. But if you are a, a private practitioner, which I am also, I also uh, have my own pr private clinic where I try to attract patients, I need to make sure that my patients are able to get an online consultation and also pay. You know, this is not charity. So how do you pay? You pay by integrating your uh, website with the payment gateway. Now, how does that happen? That happens. That's a long process. So you'll have to get to your banks. You'll have to create, uh, uh, first of all, you need to have a business. So you need to register yourself as a private, enter private uh, enterprise or a uh, you know, there are uh, some of these things that everybody has to uh, get used to and get to know. So that's the reason why it's important to know a lot more than uh, than just your ENT, you know. So you need to get to know uh, the financial aspects of it. You need to get to know uh, how to uh, reach out to the world out there uh, in a much different way. And... Uh, uh, I, I like the phrase beginning of the end of office culture. I think uh, online is a way forward and all of us have to be prepared for this. I am telling all my patients uh, who, are, uh, who don't need an essential visit, especially the follow-up patients, especially the elderly patients who, don't, who, are, uh, who, don't, who have a non-essential visit to uh, reach me online. That's a message I have. So now how do you reach all your patients online? We have now developed, I have purchased um, a, a smaller version of a hospital information system, a HIS system, uh, where through which I can in, uh, feed uh, uh, or send bulk SMSs or bulk emails. Now I'm telling you all this is because I have done this, you know, du during the uh, lockdown, we didn't waste time, but we started looking at the future and we started building up a base for what can be our practice in the future. So sending mass SMSs, mass uh, uh, emails are not easy as well. You know, Google lets you send a few set of mails. Uh, there are uh, a few other websites which, which let you send mass emails, you know. But if a lot of people put it as spams, these uh, websites which offer free services block your, uh, your email and then you're no longer able to send this. So we've, we've been through all this. So that's not a permanent solution. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is to have a software again and organize yourself. And there are uh, agencies which you can register into, pay some money, and then you can reach out to all your patients at one go and say, okay, this is uh, my schedule and this is how you can contact me. So we need to adapt ourselves. And that's those are the challenges I think all of us face as consultants. So now uh, I want to skip this uh, session uh, uh, completely uh, 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 for... Uh, 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 the positive of time that we have. I think uh, Chetan had a few slides. Yeah, Chetan, I will address that. I yeah, will address that. Yeah, yeah, so please, can you just uh, uh, go through this and then uh, the rest of us will just probably agree to whatever you say. Yeah, uh, basically, uh, we have, uh, there is only one definitive test and that is a uh, real-time rever reverse transcript test, polymerase chain reaction. Now, this can be from uh, a nasal swab or oral swab or from a tracheal aspirate. So with the nasal swab, the accuracy is about 67%. That means 30% of your patients will test as false negative. So even if the patient is positive, you will have a negative report. And that, that is a problem, isn't it? And the other uh, diagnostic method which is used 
is a uh, testing of the serum for antibodies but uh, that is not uh, helpful because it is only a retrospective assessment of the attack rate and in uh, places where uh, there is a paucity of uh, rt pcr tests you can uh, do chest x rays and uh, ct scans where you find a bilateral hazy opacities which are suggestive of uh, covid and there is a grading uh, on conrad scale from 1 to 25 so uh, on ct uh, thorax so that can be a, a guide uh, a suggestive guide that okay this patient may be uh, a covid positive case because uh, we have seen uh, in our experience that a lot of asymptomatic patients have bad x rays and bad bad ct uh, uh, bad uh, chest on uh, ct scan so uh, the symptoms and uh, the x rays don't correlate at all so Uh, these are the tools that you can uh, choose preoperatively uh, to uh, triage your patients and uh, uh, schedule them for surgeries and uh, plan accordingly okay. okay chetan can i ask you a question on this um, yes very interesting uh, three things which you have mentioned there yeah uh, are these practical that why i'm asking is when one test has got such a low sensitivity and yes. negative predictive value is very high uh that means you need to do another test in 24 hours just to increase or augment the sensitivity do your hospital has a policy on that double testing uh, within certain uh, time uh, if the patient is going through a probably a skull based procedure or endoscopic sinus surgery or a aerosol generating procedure in ENT and even after two tests if you are mandating a ct thorax or just ct whether it is feasible in a situation like in india or even let's say in new zealand where public health is provided 100% um and uh, during the covid era we did quite a lot of head and neck cancer surgeries when they were suspected and the upper airway mucosal surgery was involved they are the anesthetists uh, asked for a test single test but after a week uh, that became two tests negative but ct thorax wasn't there um i was just interested in that uh, what you said yes uh, what's happening here uh, where i work is uh, all the patients get a rt pcr whoever is scheduled for surgery preoperatively uh, they get a rt pcr what uh, we are uh, doing currently is that uh, we are admitting all patients uh, who have been approved by insurance uh, the elective surgeries they are being admitted 3 uh, days prior to uh, their surgical procedure like uh, we was uh, saying that um, some are home quarantined in his country preoperatively for 3 days here uh, what we do is we admit them to the hospital and then uh, we wait for the result and once the result is negative we post them for surgeries if they test positive if they test positive they are admitted for treatment of covid yeah yeah so if they are asymptomatic they get home quarantined and they receive the treatment at home if they are symptomatic they are admitted to the covid ward in the hospital so if they test negative we proceed with the surgery but with all precautions so uh, it's like we are wearing full ppe for almost all cases which are generating high uh, aerosols and uh, this double testing we are doing when there is a very high clinical correlation but there is a negative report okay yeah can i say yeah i don't right yeah i'll go ahead i am concerned that you know you you are doing a test two days before and then proceeding because the incubation period is more than that yeah there is goal that we are here you know we haven't started elective surgeries yet but even yes. the head and neck cancers what we are doing mm-hmm. is uh, we are doing the the test at least two weeks before and then they are quarantined for two weeks and two days before the operation they get another test and only if that is negative we proceeding with the operation 
Yeah. Uh, Just to be hundred percent safe. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree with you. But uh, uh, here, uh, it's not uh, very practical to wait for too long. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if they're asymptomatic, uh, they are test. The results are available uh, uh, within forty-eight hours. Okay. So. Uh, so we just uh, assume that everybody is COVID. So that that should be the basic policy. That's what I feel. Treat every patient as COVID, regardless of uh, the report. Yeah. Like I said, uh, uh, nasal swab will is just around 67% accurate. Yes. So you are missing almost 33%. That's a huge number. So yes. what we do here is we assume every patient as positive, and we all wear those shields and N95 masks and goggles and proceed accordingly. And uh, in my slides, I'm covering a little bit of uh, how uh, we are managing it in the OT and I'll dwell on that. So okay. like you said, uh, it is practically not possible, uh, you know, how insurance works and how uh, patients do window shopping uh, when it comes to hospitals. You can't wait for 14. If you tell them, no, you have to wait for two weeks, some of them may not never turn up to your hospital. They may go to some other hospital who says, okay, come, we'll do it a little earlier. Mm -hmm. That is a thing. We we will be discussing this in in the subsequent section uh, in great detail. I think this is this should be the core issue. Of when do we do the testing? What are the protocols? And I think we should compare the protocols between individual countries. So Arun, your slides, and then we'll go to the clinical part. So this is your slide, Arun. Okay. So the I just showed this. You know, this is a test being done. I think in China. I I I'll tell you what happened. I started my on call two weeks after the lockdown. And on the fourth day, I had a bit of dry feeling in the throat and started coughing. So immediately I told the, my colleague that, you know, I don't feel, there's no illness. So I, I said, I'm not uh, going to carry on because I'm coughing. And I went home and for the first 12 hours, I felt like an imposter because nothing was happening. Then what happened is uh, the next day, the cough became much worse. Then I started off with severe headaches and nasal congestion, extraocular myalgia and all those things. But I didn't have fever. I did not have generalized body ache. But the cough was so bad that, you know, you have to catch each cough with the tissue. And I had one or two sacks full of tissues in my room because I was isolated in one of the bedrooms in my house. It was the time when I invited you for the webinar, isn't it? We exchanged a couple of messages. Was yes. It? Yeah, I don't, so, yeah. So then... So I had this test done, you know, they are horrendous, okay? And they, they, what do you have to, if you want to get a positive test, you have to go right into the nasopharynx and be being ENT surgeons. I thought that that is one of the most horrendous tests I've undergone in my life. And, um, but unfortunately they, or fortunately the test was negative. The so I was 100% sure that I had waiting for antibody testing to start. So what we are doing here is, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So uh, what we are here doing is, uh, currently what we are doing is all the symptomatic group of patients, I, everybody admitted to the hospital is tested with the PCR testing. But anybody uh, who is feeling ill, they, they have a telephone consultation with their doctor. Here, there are GPs. And then they are sent to COVID testing centers. And they will just uh, sit in the car. And they get tested like this. And uh, you get the test uh, result within uh, 24 to 48 hours. The, the capacity is there. And uh, the government wants to increase the capacity to 100,000 tests a day. So that they are trying to achieve politically. You know, I think it's, it's going to happen. But the community screening with antibody testing, it was only licensed yesterday. And uh, we're going to start that very soon, okay? But the outpatients, nobody is getting testing. We are not doing routine outpatients yet. We are going to start maybe in about a few weeks time, initially with head and neck cancers. And we, 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 we've been asked to look at the referrals and classify it into a traffic light system, red, green, and amber, okay? Red means cancer or something nasty. See them immediately. Amber is something not very good, like uh, cholesteatoma or cholesterol pain or something like that. You, they get the priority. And anybody with nasal obstruction and sinusitis or a chronic otitis media, they get the last priority, green. So the outpatients are not screened, but inpatients, all emergencies are screened. Like I said, elective surgery is going to restart. But what we are going to do is do a test 
and then they are going to self isolate for two weeks and then two days before the test the operation the two days before the operation they get another test and it all has to be negative this is because there is another slide you know i just send you uh, of all the aerosol generating procedures in ent systematic review and that shows quite a lot of what we do is uh, aerosol generating correct correct right uh, so um, uh, yeah so there is this section uh, and i'll i'll include a poll here so what do you think do, uh, this poll uh, asks a question do you think the covid 19 pandemic will continue into the next year there should be a yes and no but i'm sorry there's a yes and yes so if it's a yes and no what what do you think arun am um, will it continue for i think it is going to continue at least for the, the problem is all the viral infections of this nature at least in the western world they get yeah. worse during the winter months so i have um, it's possible that it is going to continue till next year till next year uh, subhash i think at some form uh, as soon as the aviation industry starts their game um if the country doesn't have a very good um, uh checks at the gates and quarantine uh that's going to cause quite a lot of uh, isolated outbreaks mm -hmm. and this outbreaks can impact um economy and it can go for another 2 to 3 years i would think uh, that's that's uh, practical i think i think uh, yeah. it will be that long uh, it's not something that will go away in 6 months for sure right see and i think the most important thing is they they will have a second wave so what after after the all quarantines and then what's next so we were about the second wave also so probably next year is a doubt okay okay right so uh, uh now as the polls go on uh what uh, uh now i'll ask this question to each one of you just a quick uh, couple of rounds do you think uh, the lockdowns are all over behind us i think uk is still in a lockdown uh, 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 arun uh, so let's begin with subhash so i think subhash uh, as if i am not wrong new zealand has uh, is over and done with the lockdown isn't it so no 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 we are in uh, still in lockdown phase 2 okay that means eliminate mm -hmm. uh, we had a model of um, like all these uh, um, lockdowns has come from uh, influenza as you have showed us mm -hmm. in your slide influenza taught us in the past and many of the western countries have got disaster preparedness for mm -hmm. influenza but coronavirus is something different it had r0 value of uh, infecting two to three people uh, other than the influenza mm -hmm. so uh the uh so a lockdown um the coming to the question uh the four lockdown four was intense physical distancing that's the whole idea of lockdown actually mm -hmm. uh, and contain the spread within the community or within the group okay so that easy to uh trace the contacts mm -hmm. um so as the lockdown uh slows and relaxes it is very difficult to trace the contacts so okay. if the country has got high community spread lockdown releasing the lockdown is not an answer uh, if the community spread is minimized almost uh, uh, almost to a very manageable number then releasing lockdown to a lower levels is very understandable level 1 is uh, not yet come a level 2 more than 100 people cannot aggregate more than 10 people in a, in a home situation can't be there are a lot of restrictions is even in level 2 of the lockdown of what you call it as phase 2 mm -hmm. so uh, these uh, uh, has to be followed uh, very intensely otherwise we will defeat the purpose of uh, our own uh, success uh, in corona control yeah so white sea in hong kong do you think uh, you've started surgeries what are, what's your position uh, is your clinical practice open Yes, we are almost um to the normal practice now and um we trying to resume all the elective surgeries um and the local and general and uh, we do see normal outpatient clinics um almost normal now. Okay. 
Okay, right. Okay. Um, and Puya is not here with us. Chetan, what do you think? Is it time to start the practice? Uh, how, how is it? I, I'm sure you've you guys have already started uh, clinical practice. Yes, it? yes, yes. Uh, uh, initially, uh, there was a fear that uh, the whole hospital will be open and uh, we'll have a lot of cases and we have to, like uh, Arun was mentioning, that uh, many of the OTs are being converted into uh, ICUs. Now, that has not happened here mm -hmm. till now. Mm -hmm. So the government uh, suggested that, you know, we can get along with uh, surgeries, which are emergencies and semi-emergencies. Okay. So as of now, like I told you, we are testing everyone and uh, we have a protocol to follow, uh, like elaborated at that time. Yeah. So we are getting on with it and slowly and eventually, I think uh, we'll start listing uh, really elective cases and uh, get them done as well. Okay. So uh, can you just go through this slide is quickly? Uh, so uh, one second, I'll just minimize these. So, like I told you, uh, uh, we are admitting patients around three to five days in advance for close observation of symptoms and then RT-PCR. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying to enhance uh, PP supply and uh, each OR member uh, will have to use multiple sets in a single day. So, if, if you can't uh, like wear the same PP uh, for each and every case. Uh, so, there is a possibility that you will transmit uh, uh, the infection from a COVID positive patient to a COVID negative patient who has come to the elective surgery. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, the way forward is you have to fortify all uh, existing uh, ORs with uh, good scavenging, HEPA filters, negative pressure rooms uh, for uh, surgeries and post-op care. And there is another uh, major thing that is usually ignored is how are you going to uh, dispose of all this medical waste and uh, how do you decontaminate and how do you reuse all this uh, equipment and uh, uh, say surgical instruments. So all this will have to be uh, looked into and you need to have a proper plan. And uh, if you have a lot of staff at your disposal, then you can have a uh, you can make separate teams which operate on particular days of the week and uh, they're off on particular days so that you reduce the exposure to all these uh, individuals. And then uh, another aspect is that with all this, the healthcare costs are going to go up. And um, if you have a clientele uh, who are uh, uh, cash patients, then possibly you will have to uh, talk to them about uh, what is causing this uh, increases in uh, I think I think cost. that's a very good point because yeah uh, uh, the healthcare costs are going to go up you know so it's it's difficult to balance uh, between testing and the cost now what's happening in, here in India is we are not told to test all patients now we're going to come to that I'll just quickly uh, go to the next section because this matter will be continued here and I'll I'll take the lead here now if you look at this. Uh, contrary to many other countries, we are not told to test all patients. I think it, it comes from uh, from the fact that there are too many people and it's difficult to manage all of them. So if you look at this uh, chart, and this is a, a guideline issued by uh, my hospital authority. I work in a couple of hospitals, uh, primarily in one and then uh, in another. So this is in um, from uh, my uh, main hospital. So here, if you see the blue uh, column here, it says, um, it says that if this is a patient who is asymptomatic, uh, 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 you know, without fever and other things, don't do anything. Ah, no, this, sorry, this slide is for, um, for, for travel between, uh, for, for travel uh, of patients between zones. Now, India is divided into uh, a red zone, orange zone, and green zones. Now, the green zone apparently are safe zones where there are no COVID positive uh, cases or COVID activity at the moment. Orange is somewhere in between red are those very severely affected zones. Now this uh, uh, slide says that if there is a patient that wants to move between green districts, you do not need to put the patient in isolation. You do not need to do any uh, uh, tests if the patient is uh, asymptomatic. But if the patient is symptomatic, the test is mandatory and admission has to be done in an isolated flow. Now, if it's an inter-red district, 
whether the patient is asymptomatic or not. They say that the test is strongly recommended, but not compulsory. Admission to the topmost floor because this uh, our hospital has uh, uh, close to 15 floors, and this is to the um, uh, the upper floors. If the test is negative, they can be shifted to any non-isolation ward. And if the if the patient is symptomatic, and if the uh, test is uh, then the test becomes mandatory, and the patient is admitted in the fifth floor, which is an isolation ward. The test turns negative, move to the non-isolation. If the test is positive, then home quarantine is uh, recommended. So this is what um, uh, is issued to us for inviting patients. Now that we have started clinical practice, we started our practice, our lockdown got over last week and now we've started practice. So the first guideline was who can you let in? You know, uh, Are you allowed to call patients from other parts of India, other zones, uh, uh, COVID zones in India? So this is the guideline uh, that deals with it. Now, uh, yeah, the, the, now, this slide shows that uh, we have consent sheets which we have to hand over to all the patients that come to us. So the first one describes what the patient's responsibilities are and what uh, 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 he can ex expect uh, in the hospital as far as COVID is concerned. And the second one is, is a form that actually uh, uh, mandates him to uh, sign and consent for all that uh, he or she would uh, uh, would undergo in the hospital. Now, this here uh, is an interesting um, uh, questionnaire. Now, there is something called an adult pre-surgical COVID-19 questionnaire. Now, we are supposed to ask all these questions, occupation, travel history, family history, contact history, and symptoms, if any, in the last 20, uh, 28 days. And then we're supposed to tick yes or no. Now, if you look at this guideline, it says for emergency procedures, Please go the above sheet, but you can go ahead with surgery with, with or without uh, ID specialist, uh, internal medicine physician, pulmonologist uh, consultation with full PPE in designated OTs. Okay, so if there's an emergency, we go in with full PPE uh, without testing, without uh, waiting for the test. If it's a semi-urgent procedure, then the questionnaire comes into play. If the answer to all the questionnaire board is no, then you may proceed for surgery. Again, we are not told to mandatorily do COVID tests. If the answer to any of the above is yes, consult an ID specialist who will then obviously measure the case and then most likely this patient ends up with a COVID uh, test. For elective procedures, again, we go through this, please go the above sheet, refer to the um, ID specialist, internal medicine physician, if, the, if there are more no's then, uh, if there are more yeses than no's in this form. So this is uh, uh, how we are asked to deal with all the patients coming in. Now, we are not testing all our OPD patients for COVID. Of course, there are not too many patients coming in. Our workload has come down. In a busy On a busy day, we see close to 70 to 100 patients every day in our ENT OPD. So we are seeing close to one third that number, close to about 10, 15 cases, okay? So now this is another guideline. Uh, from another hospital. So the one on the right is simplified to the one on the left. So you can focus uh, on, on the columns here on the left. So this is what we call category A patient. Now, if the, if the uh, patient does not have any symptoms, or I think I have to go through this because this is more clear in that uh, way. The pathway is more clearer. If you look at this, suspect COVID when, the fee when there is fever, respiratory symptoms, muscle pain, blah, 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 all the symptoms related to uh, COVID, STEMI, stroke, st uh, stroke less than, uh, in uh, uh, in an uh, age group less than 50 years, atypical Kawasaki and all that. So suspect COVID. Now, if the SpO2 in such a patient is greater than 95 and the vitals are stable, reliable follow-up ensured, and if the patient is young, then the patient is categorized as category A for which we need to do a chest X-ray, but not a COVID test. The, uh, and uh, the patient can be symptomatically treated. Uh, and if the, uh, uh, if the patient improves fine, if the patient deteriorates, then the patient goes into category B. In category B, there is again B1 and B2. B1 are essentially those patients above 60 years who are all then tested for COVID. Uh, and they, uh, they go through the same procedure. So you see this category A is what I'm focusing on. There is a significant group of symptomatic people who are not tested for COVID, okay? 
and uh, most of them are young patients. Now, greater than 60 years with symptoms, category B1, tested for COVID. Now, symptoms with any of these, if the respiratory rate is uh, decreasing, SpO2 levels are less than 90, lung signs, obvious uh, COVID uh, cases, they're all category B2, and then there are very severe cases, obviously, patients who end up in ICU category C. Uh, so you see that there is a significant uh, a population of patients with which are whom we are told, symptomatic patients whom we are told not to do a COVID test, but follow them up strictly. So this here, reliable follow-up to be ensured is, is very important, okay? So that's that's something that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's what I'm, I'm doing and I'm told to do that, okay? Now, as far as OTs, okay, let, let me uh, uh, take your opinion on, on, on this uh, from all of you. So, Arun, what do you think? So, what do you think of these guidelines that we have in India and compare that vis-a-vis -vis what, what you, I, I'm sure, are told to test all your patients? So, what do you think uh, uh, should be done? And is this the right thing to do? I think the, the problem is that, you know, the, the initial stages, patients are going to be asymptomatic, okay? They yeah. can be symptomatic carriers. And for example, I saw that in London, they did initial antibody testing. 14% mm -hmm. of the pop, uh, population has been you know, tested positive, mm -hmm. uh, even without having any symptoms. Mm -hmm. so, the, the, the problem is, if you get, then do an operation on these guys, mm -hmm. and you have an aerosol generating procedure, for example, mm -hmm. drilling can be quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's not only you, all the nursing staff, and everybody in the theater and the anesthetist is going to be in trouble. Okay. Unless, even if you wear PPE, you mm. know, it's uh, N95 is 95, 95% sort of protective. But mm -hmm. the problem is, you know, if you, if you think that there is a problem with a chance of, if you do the test and if it is negative, at least you've done it, okay? Mm -hmm. But I will be very worried about operating on anybody without a test, unless it is a life-saving situation. If somebody is going to die and you have to do a tracheostomy, as a doctor, you will do it. But mm -hmm. for everything else, um, you have to be prepared. Do you know that the first person, first doctor to die in the UK was an ENT surgeon? Yeah, I know. Unfortunately, you know, he, he, I don't know how it happened, but, you know, probably he did operations without PPE. Several doctors have died here, and mm -hmm. about 130 healthcare workers have died as well. Okay. So it's a risk. Yes, see, Arun, what happened was in the beginning when. Uh, when all this was at its peak, you know, uh, we were testing everybody. But then, the, and the hospitals, uh, I, I can show you uh, regulations that came before this and compare it with the ones which we have right now. So then we realized that we can't really test everybody because there's so many people in an Indian context. And, you know, with, with an Indian background, you would agree with me that if, if we, if after the lockdown, so during the lockdown, we had like two patients every day. Now we have 20 and I'm sure that in, in, a, uh, in less than, Two weeks time we'll we'll be back to more or less our normal usual uh, number of patients which is close to 100 patients every day now can can we test uh, all 100 we don't have the capacity at this point of time so this uh, is what is the reality and this is how we are dealing with this and i know that a lot of indians are watching this so this these these are guidelines that most hospitals have and i'm sure the guidelines uh, which are followed in individual hospitals here i'm showing manipal apollo spectra a couple of places where i work but these are percolating from the higher authorities uh, yeah, and i'm sure you uh, uh, you'll have different uh, uh, protocols so white c what's your take uh, uh, for for us actually the um, the testing it will be difficult and limited by the, um, uh, the availability and uh, our, our lab uh, are limited. So we just do all the tests for um, positive contact symptomatic patients and um, sometimes voluntary. So we didn't actually do all, all tests for every elective or emergency cases. Just that they, if they have POCC, uh, positive and they have fever or symptoms, they would always need a chest x-ray. So if there is a chest x-ray abnormalities, then we will proceed for the test. And otherwise we will, we will not do the test, but if the operations are related to the airway and or are also generating, we are allowed to have like full PPE. So we, uh, if that is a super emergency, 
then we treat everyone. So you never, if you're not tested, you treat everyone as if infected. You have to protect yourself. You have to protect ourselves, uh, our staffs. Okay. So I think um, treat everyone as if a positive case, then um, then 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 sh it should be fine. Okay. And, so uh, yes. So uh, sorry to bother you, sir. There are a few questions in I'm, the I'm, audience. I'm seeing those can... questions. I'm seeing those questions. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, what we are discussing right now would answer some of the questions now. I can see that Dr. Vijay Lakshmi has asked a question. Now she asks, why isn't India do, uh, 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 testing as many uh, people as, as uh, let's say, South Korea? That's, that's the question. They test everyone. So why isn't India? I think the fact is that India is not prepared to handle uh, 100 patients being tested in OPD in one hospital. In Bangalore, we have close to our hundred hospitals, if you open up all of that, you're looking at thousands of patients and I'm talking just about ENT OPD. And if you look at all the subspecialities put together, multiplied by all the hospitals that are there in Bangalore alone, we are looking at probably 10,000 or 15,000 OPD patients. And it's impossible I, uh, uh, to uh, test all of them and, uh, and uh, you know, wait for 48 hours for the result to come and then ask them to come later. So this is not gonna uh, uh, happen anytime soon uh, because uh, uh, the, our testing capacity uh, uh, over the last one, one and a half months has grown from, uh, I think a couple of centers in the beginning of the lockdown to uh, a few uh, uh, close to 100 or 150 centers, but that's really not enough. So till we improve our logistics till we are able to provide more centers. I think this is a policy that has to be followed. It's a no-win situation, but that's the way to go forward. Yes, Arun, I can uh, see you raise your hand. Yeah. I think, see, the outpatient visits are different, okay? I was telling you about the operations and inpatient. Oh, the, this slide is uh, for, uh, for OPD patients. Uh, okay. My next slide will deal with uh, OT. Yes. Okay, but in your top, it says elective surgery treatment protocol. So I got mistaken. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry about that. So, yeah. I think for an outpatient procedure, we are not doing any testing. Nobody will be able to. That is outrageous, you know, because even here it will be impossible. So what, what we are doing is we are actually getting a secretary to phone them and say, if you have fever or something like that, don't come in. And then Correct. as soon as they walk into the hospital, they will we'll check the temperatures and then, yes. then we will see them. And then in the clinic, we will be wearing, you know, a surgical mask. And unless you're doing aerosol generating procedures, you won't waste time. Yes. And then you find things like that. But uh, there yes. is, as far as possible, we try to stay away. But an ENT is almost impossible, isn't it? It's impossible. So what yeah. we also do is to do a thermal test, which is practically the norm now. Everywhere we go, right from airports to everybody uh, holds a gun on your head. You know, a thermal uh, sensor is used to eliminate all 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 the uh, uh, the fever patients. So once they step in, we take our precautions, which is not too much. And I'm going to. Uh, um, come to that later. We are not doing as much as probably the dentists are doing, but then the dentists are doing a procedure apart from a consultation in the same sitting. So they go full PE. In my uh, setup, all I do is uh, put a N95 and a face shield to see my patients and then use some of the techniques, which I'm sure a few of us will discuss. Uh, Arun, you have some uh, techniques uh, that you will have to show. So we will come to that. So Chetan, you, you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, uh, there, there are some questions from uh, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi. Uh, yes, is it okay please. if I can answer them? Yeah, please go ahead. Now, one thing uh, she has asked is: uh, Is PPE foolproof? And if it is so, then how comes a lot of people have died? A medical uh, care, yes. um, doctors and nurses. Uh, no, PPE is not foolproof. Yes. Uh, you need to, uh, even if it's a N95, you need to check it for a good seal. Yes. And uh, aerosol doesn't travel in a straight line. So even if you wear a shield, you may not be protected. Even if you wear goggles or and N95, when you uh, take it off uh, and uh, when you put it on again, or you reuse and or you readjust PPE, there's a possibility that you can contaminate yourself. Good. And uh, as far as uh, this, a uh, lot of healthcare workers dying, I think most of them uh, uh, succumb to this infection when uh, there was not much awareness and uh, in the early stages of the pandemic where they didn't expect uh, a lot of patients to be positive. Correct. Uh, 
there were a lot of asymptomatic patients who came into OPDs and uh, nobody ever realized that, uh, you know, this could be a pandemic. And I think that's how the ENT surgeon in uh, the UK died. I, I think at that point of time, nobody was really aware that how devastating this was. Correct. Now people are uh, becoming more aware, more uh, PPE is available in the market. And um, a lot of people are buying it from various sources like Amazon or some companies directly and uh, they are trying to you know uh, make an investment into safety so uh, what is very important to remember is still the most important thing is distancing yourself from uh, you know other people when you are outside it's not necessary that you are a healthcare worker and, and you will get your infection from the hospital no it is possible that a lot of you will get infections from going to the supermarket not not maintaining a distance between people or pressing a button in the lift and uh, rubbing your eye with the, uh, the same hand. And uh, you can also get infected when you are taking out your PPE and uh, not observing good hand hygiene. So it's very important to remember that PPE is protective to some extent. Uh, what you have to do is be very, very careful when removing and disposing of the PPE. And after doing everything, wash yourself nicely with soap. So that is very, very important to remember. Subhash, uh, what, what do you do in an OPD? Uh, do you screen, yeah. How do you screen your patients? Interesting um, uh, area because a um, lot of our patients need um, uh, aerosol generating or droplet generating procedures. So what we do in New Zealand, what we did in the uh, high time of a pandemic was uh, we had screening uh, as Aaron, uh, sorry, Arun said um, telephone uh, to the patient or when the patient came in hospital had a screening booth where uh, temperature and screening questions were asked. Everything negative, then they were let in uh, for their individual appointments. And even the outpatients, they are not sitting together. They're again uh, following the uh, social distancing. And... Um, when they come in, it depends on pa patient interaction, what kind of PPE you need to. If the patient has got a, a horses of voice or a dysphagia, you need to see that area and you know it is an aerosol generating procedure, even though, you know, flexible nasal endoscopy, not intrinsically an AGP, but they may cough or sneeze and then it becomes an aerosol generating procedure. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, just uh, sneezing and coughing is airborne uh, level precautions you need, uh, even the patient is in front of you. ENT, head and neck examination, you need to wear PPE. But most importantly, um, in a situation like what you are right now, um, rather than testing, you're protecting yourself and your uh, staff is very important. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, protecting yourself uh, with the uh, the eye protection because virus can enter through conjunctiva, uh, and uh, covering your hair and even the shoes and all your uh, thing and gowns, uh, sorry, gloves and um, even surgical mask is good enough. But if the patient has got any positive uh, idea of having positive COVID or suspected. Uh, you should wear N95, which is fitted for you, uh, because fit tested N95 is uh, foolproof. And as Arun says, 95% of the time, but fit not tested N95 is like having a surgical mask. So you need to follow that. Uh, we followed that kind of thing. Now, um, now there is a there is there is a, a issue here now in uh, in uh, government setups public health systems it works now in a private hospital in a private clinic uh, everything has to be charged to the patient now if the doctor buys a certain number of sets n95s and you know so if how do you divide this on the patient so again the cost factor how, how, how do you, uh, you, you can't charge one uh, kit on one patient and throw it and, and wear a new kit and, and see another patient. So this is going to be a problem. And in my clinic, I face the problem as well. So what we uh, decided is to, uh, of course, we are having very few patients now, but we are clustering patients. 
we are asking uh, 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 many patients to come at the same time so we use one set for let's say five patients uh, and and uh, unless there is a very uh, symptomatic patient which has never happened so uh, and then we divide the cost of that one ppe which involves the entire thing shield and and the mask over these five patients so that's how we're doing it but that's kind of no, arbitrary that's there's no real rules so um, uh, and then uh, uh, when we go to the theater for instance the theater pp uh, costs are also divided among all the patients so are uh, divided uh, are put up on to each patient so that adds to the cost and in the theater the costs are enormous because we are looking at five or seven people's full ppe which uh, which is a significant amount that comes up to at least 15% increase or 20% increase in the sur surgical costs uh so all this is going to play a role you know it's not easy uh, yeah. to constantly rely on ppe as a solution for uh, you know i think the solution lies in testing more making sure people are uh, supposedly you know covid free and then you can reduce on your ppe rather than uh, test no one and then assume everybody is covid positive and then go on putting ppe for all your patients i think that's that will work now but you, you maybe you may be absolutely right there, Sampath, because there is a lot of community level spread uh, mm -hmm. there and you don't know who walks into you. So you need to yeah. be, um, you need to follow health and safety guidelines. So you need to have some amount of value where clinical judgment uh, comes in, health and safety of not only yourself, your, your staff, you want and to uh, right. also people who are special cases, like some of the cases you may be seeing more than 60 year old comorbid patients, or they may have some inherent respiratory illness because most of our ENT patients smoke and they develop ENT related issues. They are special risk and high risk patients. And also you need to look at public health as well. Like people who are sitting in your um, you know, waiting room, they, you need to be looking at them and also, if uh, also provide caution where when you are in doubt, err on the side of a caution rather than to the uh, brave side. Perfect. Now, if you look at this video, this is from um, my uh, friend and colleague uh, uh, who is a dentist. Uh, the husband and wife both are dentists and both are classmates and both are my, my colleagues and friend. And this is how they run their private dental clinic. They are dentists, and they, this is how they run their dental clinic. Pretty uh, look, safe in these difficult times. I just quickly and, play the uh, slide. We understand that there are patients who now cannot defer treatment, and life has to move on. But we must be careful simultaneously. We are taking all precautions henceforth so that we keep not only our staff safe but also our patients safe. So as soon as the patient enters, the temperature is checked. They're made to wear a protective gear. The shoes are covered. The clothing is covered with a surgical gown. The eyes are covered. A surgical cap is given. Once they enter the dental operatory, the, the, the patient that kill the viruses and asks to proceed for the dental treatment caters to only one patient at the moment and we shift the other patients to the different face shields to cover up any aerosol which is we try to keep everybody safe in these difficult times and uh, okay so i i just showed that uh, to discuss with you guys whether we should be wearing that attire to see all our OPD patients. Of course, with the dentist, it's a little different. Uh, uh, before that, thanks, Rajat and Prerna, if you are seeing this uh, show. So I uh, uh, really appreciate uh, you sharing the video with, uh, with me and I'm grateful uh, to you for that. So now, um, so do you think we need to get into that attire to see all our patients because we do get fairly close to uh, uh, the, the nose and, and the oral cavity. Uh, and do you think it's feasible for us to do that? With the dentist, it's different because they have an entire procedure to do, which will take a, a, a long time, um, uh, uh, maybe a couple of hours. So it, it's really worth it. But then uh, is it feasible to wear the entire thing for an OPD examination? 
Sampat, can I, um, uh, that's a great video from your friends, actually. My wife is a dent dentist and she has not worked for four or five weeks because New Zealand Dental Association said no. Uh, and now they're re uh, relaxing. The problem is they need to wear loops and the light. Uh, sometimes we using a face shield is a big issue uh, with the, attaching the loops. So magnification uh, is, is essential when you're doing root canal treatments and other things. So they may find that is a bit of barrier you're using uh, thing. And also while uh, operating in the oral cavity, they are at risk and one to two hours in that PPE can make anybody hot inside in a humid country like ours in India. And uh, it's quite hot inside. That P and even uh, that N95 mask, you can get a headache after one to two uh, hours of continuous use because of oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide retention in the blood or some other mechanism. Uh, so, and also those gowns are really hot inside. So I don't know um, if you are in a Mangalore with 40 degree humidity with PPE, uh, you should have a fridge connected to you to cool you down actually. So there are a lot of disadvantage of wearing PPE for longer duration. Perfect. White C? Yeah. Well, uh, basically I think um, PPE um, for us, if we are doing all aerosol generating procedure like the flexible endoscopies and uh, some um, uh, mastoid drilling and um, uh, laryngeal tracheostomy, of course. But, and in OPD, if we are doing a rosal generating procedure, yes, we, we have um, PPE, but uh, our PPE, PPE are just level one PPE and not as, as gorgeous as you guys have. These actually, we think uh, the most important thing is the N95 to protect the, um, the rosal. And the hands yeah. that the skin, Basically, you wash hands, you clean, um, uh, or alcohol swab between patients, and these are adequate enough. So we, we don't look too professional, too over over protected. But it is, I think, it make you good, but uh, looks looks safe. But it, in fact, for us, our experience from SARS is that most of the of the infection we get is not because of not enough PPE, but not inappropriate method when you are removing them. Mm -hmm. So the right way to removing the PPE is more important than what PPE that you have. So a good, good fitting mask is very important. Good fitting N95 is really important. And um, you have to know how uh, not to be using it, you're right. And you have to know how to remove your PPE that's the easiest way to contaminate not only your, you and also your stars, like your nurses standing behind, next to you. If you're down down here, then, then she will be at risk. So uh, I think education on gown down is more important than what actually what kind of things that you have. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Chetan, go ahead. Uh, uh, there was an article in Medscape uh, uh, sometime in the first week of April uh, in memoriam of all the healthcare workers who died uh, until now. If you see, actually, uh, it's the least number is from anesthesia and intensive care. That is because we people are the most careful when it comes to handling the patient, when it comes to talking to a patient, and uh, wherever we are, we are always extra cautious. And uh, the most people who have died are like uh, dentists and uh, some nurse from radiography department or some uh, uh, cardiac surgeon uh, who, has seen, who has seen possibly contracted the infection somewhere in the OPD. So I feel that the more careful you are, the better. Uh, the most important thing, like Wade pointed out, is the N95 mask and uh, protect yourself uh, with a shield. That is the minimum. Rest of it, uh, whatever uh, you can wear and you can tolerate uh, for longer hours, it's better. But N95 mask, a proper fitting one, is an absolute must. There should be no compromise on that. And uh, uh, like uh, 
Dr. Subhash was mentioning that his wife is a dentist. Uh, can I suggest something? You can wear uh, swimming goggles, which is not worn very tight, that can uh, protect you, your eyes, and uh, uh, basically you have to be very careful when removing it and decontaminating it with soap and water. Okay, so, so uh, we, we need to move a little quickly here because yeah. uh, we are really, really excited. This is, this is one of the longest webinars I think you know I have been a part of. It's close to two and a half hours. So we'll wind up in the next five, seven minutes is what I've promised the, the organizers. Yes. So I'll quickly go through these um, slides. Now, we, we were speaking about the OPD uh, PPE. Now, this is what I was made to wear for uh, the, uh, the couple of surgeries that I did recently. Now, there is this first layer, if you see, you already begin to look like an astronaut. So the, this comes with the, the shoe case, shoe cover. So once you're done with the first layer, you get these kind of uh, stairs from the nurse. And then you go ahead, you start putting uh, the second layer on. Uh, this is uh, like a plastic uh, thing, which is you know common with the HIV kits and all that. And I was told that this is not necessarily a sterile thing. So I didn't wash up before uh, putting up these couple of layers. And then uh, once this was done, uh, I uh, uh, yes, the mask is obviously the N95 mask. And then there is this third thing, a hood comes down, the N95 mask, and the hood comes down. This is when you really start looking like a joker. You, you could uh, enhance the effect by uh, going in for what is called a respirator. Now this is a respirator. So with the respirator, you really look alien. That's, that's I think when uh, you really start looking funny to everybody around you, but then so this is not in, in a sequence. So uh, if you can see the cursor, this is the N95 mask being put. And then you look at this picture where I'm washing up now. So when you're washing up, you're already hot. You know, the whole experience of uh, going through the first two layers and then washing up makes you feel tired already, you know? And then you wash up and then you get into this costume with the respirator on or with the N95. I took pictures with both. I had to do a little bit of removing and putting it back. But then this is um, uh, the final picture you get either with the respirator or with the N95. This, there is actually a third layer. This is the- Were you operating on a COVID patient, uh, Sampath? Sorry to bother. Pardon me? Pardon me? Were you operating on a COVID positive patient? No, I was not. I was not, okay? okay. But now we are, uh, since uh, again, uh, we do not test all the surgical cases for COVID. Okay, again, that the, the protocol is to test only the most uh, uh, symptomatic ones or, you know, the, more or less the same uh, uh, rules apply to, uh, to the theater as well. So now what we have to do is, uh, is to be uh, hyper-protective ourselves, you know. Now everybody wears this, the anesthetist wears this, everybody is in this uh, attire. Uh, so there is a third layer, which is the final gown that comes up after scrubbing. And, uh, and, and then you wear your sterile gloves and other things. So with this, uh, you start operating. And when you start operating, uh, so that's the respirator. So when you start operating, and when you sit in front of the microscope, you realize that this is not going to work. Okay, so that's what happened with the, with the cases that I did. I just did a couple of cases after the, uh, the shutdown. Now, I felt too suffocated. I started working under the microscope it was uncomfortable. And I don't think I'll ever uh, go through the whole uh, co costume again. So what I did was I took off the mask. I put a goggles on and with the N95 mask, uh, I, I put a smaller head cap, which covered my neck effectively. And then I, I went ahead and started using the microscope. Now I, uh, I'm, I, I get irritated uh, by just simple spectacles as well. I don't wear specs. I don't wear uh, shades and other things. I don't like them. So the fact that this uh, so-called you know, swimming goggles was uh, on my eyes also irritated me, but I had to go ahead and do the procedure um, uh, with, with this. So uh, it came to that. You know, so this whole attire really sucks. I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, I can't think of a, a career where this goes on and on, you know, one or two times, three times, okay. But I, I really don't think I'll get used to this. Uh, if you ask me uh, if I would uh, uh, put all the layers on, no. 
I think I'll, uh, I'll 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 try to reduce as much as possible and see what uh, what can be done. So this really doesn't work. The OTPPE for me is very uncomfortable when it comes to surgeries, and I'm talking about ear autological uh, drilling procedures. Uh, endoscopic procedure I've not got to do one yet. I've not got an FS or you know one of these cases to do yet. Uh, there, I think things will be easier because you're looking at the microscope, you're standing away, you're not really putting your head on to something very close by like a microscope. So I think things will be better. I don't know how uh, Subhash manages with a head and neck case. We need to ask him. Uh, but this is what I personally felt after the first couple of cases that I did with the, with the, with the entire costume on. So Arun, you, you're raising your hand. Go ahead. I think, see, I'm currently doing some research on this, actually, you know, and yep. uh, all of yesterday was spent in doing that. Mm -hmm. The problem is the microscope, you're supposed to, there is an ideal working distance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that is called the eye relief. And the company is not revealing me what the eye relief is, in spite of me asking repeatedly. So I did some tests and you know, it's uh, it's about 1.5 centimeters from the edge of the uh, the the microscope eyepiece, okay? The further mm -hmm. you go away from that, the image will become, you know, very, very smaller. And mm -hmm. then what happens is it's almost, when you wear a proper eye protector, which will shield it completely, mm -hmm. it is going to be almost impossible to operate with the microscope. Unless right. you go for a custom-made sort of eye protector that, uh, like uh, swimming goggles. But then what happens is all of your face is exposed. My right. slide was there, which shows the study that they did in uh, Harvard. And uh, mm -hmm. I sent you later on, earlier on. And that mm -hmm. shows that in drilling, there is going to be a lot of aerosol. And even if you put a drape on the microscope covering the patient, these aerosols we are talking about is 100 microns is the size of the, 125 microns is the size of the normal coronavirus. Okay. So we can only assume that this is the size. So if you put a swimming goggles, what will happen is then your whole of your face will be covered. And even if you take it off and wash your face, you're going to get it into their eyes. I'm actually doing some other research activity, like a custom made facial shield, as well as, you know, this distance measurement as well. I'll let you know as soon as I've done that. Looking forward, looking forward, really, you know, that's, uh, th th this is a serious problem. And I think, uh, uh, for all autologists uh, who are dealing with the microscope regularly, we need to find out something. I personally found it very... Now, uh, ENT UK has come out with a series of slides, which I, I'm sure you've seen and you're familiar with. Now, there's a certain way of draping that they recommend. The usual draping is um, done on the microscope. And then another microscope drape is taken. The eyepiece uh, lens... Uh, sorry, not the eyepiece. The lens part of the drape is yeah. cut out and stuck to the lens. But the rest of the drape is reverse draped onto the patient, and you work under the drape. Yes. Now, I haven't tried this out, but looks interesting, and I think anything would be better than uh, than this PP that's given to me. That's what uh, uh, that's what our otologists do. Uh, they drape the microscope under the drape is reverse on, but uh, it catches through your uh, the drill sometimes, so you need to make a tent. Out of it. What you so want that, is that the, the bone and the mucosal test. Mucosal yes, Subhash, Subhash, the problem again is how do you give your instruments? You know, how does a nurse give your instruments from under the drape? So that again is, you, a, is an issue. You make a hole, a special hole for that as well. Uh, there is, um, that's away from your uh, operating area, just slightly away. So mm -hmm. there, there should be some compromise there, you know, if it's unfortunate. Yeah. Correct. One of my friends have made a video about how to do the endoscopic sinus surgery. Okay. So he used a shield and then the nurse is on the other side and she's using, a, you know, the handles of a microscope shield to pass on the instruments. So it's okay. something like that will have to be thought of, but it's still not going to be like without any, you know, any shield because you right. can't see the operating field. But, but, but other uh, ones, uh, like, endoscopic sinus surgery is still okay. You know, it's uh, you can still wear all this and your hands are away and the, and the, uh, uh, the monitor is much further away. So it won't uh, cause you that kind of claustrophobic feeling that comes in when you have the eyepiece and, and the mask together. So you cannot, you cannot use a microscope with the eye protector unless somebody comes up with a custom made version of these things. Correct. Okay? 
Correct. So I'm going to do it. So I'll let you know as soon as I can't tell you anything more. Absolutely. Top secret. Yes, we will. We will wait for it. I think you will be a savior for all ENT surgeons. White C, you have anything to say? No, we uh, we don't um, have these kind of, of uh, respirators. We just, um, I think in, in uh, that sense, doing a um, microscopic surgery with any kind of mass or, or PPE would be extremely difficult. And, uh, and the bone dust will be full of your body. And uh, for me, I would prefer an exoscope. So okay. at, yeah, yeah, I think I think it's uh, it's a good opportunity for all the endoscopic ENT surgeons to you know promote the the concept uh, uh, not only for its merits but also for uh, for the sake of COVID because an endoscopic ear surgery would solve all the problems. So it's yeah. not only with exoscope. So exoscope uh, uh, is even better in the in the. Of in course, the of course, yes, yeah external views and then you can do all the microscopy, even hand -eye surgeries, it's not limited to otology. I think I think that's true. Exoscopes will come up in a big way. I think uh, whoever, uh, whichever company, uh, I think Carlstos makes those exo exoscopes. I think uh, that's that's going to be the in thing now if uh, if COVID is here to stay. Right, so uh, Subhash, any, uh, anything else? Head and neck surgery, how do you go about doing okay. your... Head and neck surgery, um, we carried on um, when ophthalmologists and rhinologists went out of job for a while. Your slides, by the uh, way. Yeah. So that means head and neck surgery is the important surgery because airway is there. Uh, but saying that, skull based surgeons, uh, there was a large meningioma. Um, they causing uh, brain compression. They wanted to do the surgery, but they postponed it for a week. Uh, but um, I carried on with my uh, thyroid, parotid, neck dissections, uh, and mitral surgeries. But it was quite interesting during this era. So there were a lot of barriers. Mm. Diagnostic consultation was difficult. Unless I see larynx or look at the tongue base, I couldn't do anything. So there are a lot of um, issues as we discussed. Uh, Pre-surgical screening and... Um, as you know, the basic science of viral replication, I think uh, Chetan was talking about that. Um, AGP, uh, that is aerosol generating procedures like uh, diagnostic tonsillectomy, tongue based biopsies, microlaryngeal uh, biopsies, um, were all aerosol generating procedures anyway, and even the suction uh, and tracheostomy. That was the big issue because ENT is responsible for tracheostomy. Uh, these are your slides, and, Subhash, Subhash, these are your slides in case you want to. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, just I'll, I'll go through the tracheostomy part of it, because I'm sure most of our, our um, uh, audience uh, are involved in the tracheostomy. Mm -hmm. So uh, tracheostomy is considered as an aerosol generating procedure, as you all know. And it is 6.6 .6 odds ratio to uh, contact uh, COVID infections. So all our patients, we thought, okay, let's get tracheostomy guidelines. ENT UK helped us um, and the New Zealand Society and Australian Society came up. But what we used was part time uh, a, a local context. So we didn't do any tracheostomy for two to three weeks following intubation, uh, no elective tracheostomy. Uh, and um, if they really need a tracheostomy, we went uh, uh, asked for a negative pressure room in ICU. So that's very important for us. And uh, complete muscular paralysis. And uh, we didn't use electrocautery. We used a lot of local anesthetic. And um, we covered patient's mouth with the surgical mask. And um, uh, we did the procedure. Uh, and carefully with all the PPE gear, with the eye protection, helmets, and rest of the stuff. And we did not exchange the tracheostomy tube immediately. Uh, we, we usually do 24 to 48 hours or 72, but we did not do that because even exchange of the tracheostomy tube was a high risk procedure. Uh, Can I suggest something here? Yeah. Uh, Subhash, when you put the uh, surgical mask on the patient, what you can do is you can uh, you keep nasal prongs yeah. at uh, less than two liters flow. Two liters or less. Uh -huh. 
that will continue to give some apneic oxygenation to the patient there will be Correct. a laminar flow yeah so rather than just putting the surgical mask you can put nasal prongs and over that you can put surgical mask and keep yeah. the flow low yeah yeah that's it that's good, good point chetan thank you um and that's how we did and we didn't go to icu afterwards unless we were called and uh, microlaryngeal surgery we did not use any jet vents uh because jet vents is a very strong uh, aerosol generating and uh, uh anesthetics have got, uh, had quite a lot of protocols by themselves from australia australian anesthetic college we used a lot of smoke evacuators when we used the lasers uh, on the larynx and um, we didn't do unnecessary surgery because it went all the surgeries we did went through a, a committee and we had to argue that this procedure had had to be done uh, because this is the indication this is the uh, uh, real indication and that's what we had to argue with the uh, people who were naysayers you know it doesn't need to be done so in a public hospital it was very difficult but in private because you take a you do a decision making with the patient to take them to the theater you need to think about uh, everything all the protocol driven uh, uh, surgical practice at this stage the community spread is around okay right so uh, uh, we move ahead to the last uh, uh, portion of our presentation so chair uh, white see can you just uh, go uh, take us to the next few slides and uh, from now on we need to be a little quick because we we have just about 5 minutes uh, before we wind up i think we are skipping the slide so we do a socialization distancing again the last slide is very more time for the audience can we skip it yes this is how we do the walk rounds with only the surgical mask but not the ppes we have no private rooms but there are three negative uh, pressure isolation so if patients have symptoms suspected anything else push them into the negative pressure isolation room do the test and then if negative then we so initially in the clinic is up to 80% Um, attendants and we minimize the PPE use and the patients outflow. But now basically we are doing almost all normal. And uh, with that, in three months time, we accumulated more than ten thousand patients. Next. And so this are our recommendations in different settings. So we do hand hygiene in every settings, but um, for all non. non a rosal generating procedure like just toileting the ear examination of ear talking to patient without a nasal examination these we consider non rosal generation we just use surgical mask in order to save our n95 data but uh, if the any rosal generating procedure then we use n95 and eye protections disposable gown yeah, recommended disposable means no double use. or single use the gowns would would be recommended next one so um these are the recommendations i don't repeated it you have mentioned it next one so this is how we do asking tests so we have different uh, style type of energy uh, from different countries different um uh, so we do individual testing for every medical staff for connection to um a tester so we we will test how many uh, we do different procedures and test moving our head smile talking and see how the air leaks from us so these tests are important to make sure that the N95 were, were fit to to you your individual so since then we were standard then the the mask and every time you will use uh, n95 and provided by us next one uh, so um so we do uh, different levels of uh, precautions so if there's the in person clinical visit with oral examination we do uh, uh, recommend the cdc recommended proper precautions 
the, I think these are the CDC uh, criteria that everyone can read about it, and we'll skip for the Q and A from the from the audience. Next, and I think this is more important because we have all the labeling. So we have separated the red is the uh, gown up area. So we have a separated gown up and gown down areas and prevent intercross contamination. So um, for gang up areas and every area we have a mirror and next to have these kind of um, uh, reminders. So we follow the steps, wash our hands, take off our surgical mask, wash our hands, and then uh, on the 95, N95, and then um, we put on our cap, our face shield, and put on our gowns and hand gloves. And more importantly is how to take off your um, PPE. So uh, take off the gloves, wash hands. Take off the gowns, wash hands. And then uh, take off the protectors, and then take off the, the, the caps, wash hands. So these, uh, these uh, labels and reminders are present in every single gown gown area for the medical staff. So it is, these are important. Next. So this is actually how we, uh, on, on the left side is how we doing in the operation theater. So as you mentioned them, and uh, sometimes if possible, we try to use the endoscope and to uh, uh, decrease the rosal generation. And we put on N95 and uh, gown, but uh, no, no actually a press positive pressure respirator. And on your right hand side is the way that the gown that we are wearing on outpatients. So we are doing every uh, aerosol generating procedure, an N95, eye shield, head cap, but the gown is only uh, uh, level AMM, um, AAMS level one uh, uh, protection gowns. Next. So um, for the tele consultations, um, I would I would say for us we didn't do a lot of tele consultations after because uh, especially these are the steps that are recommended and uh, by the uh, healthcare private limited. But uh, we are public hospitals and we do worry about the patient privacy. So um, Zoom actually before we do have some um, privacy problems about Zoom. So we stop all the tele consultations, but uh, we look at every Every patient's individual uh, conditions, and then we call them by a phones and do some telephone consultation, but not in Zoom. To be to to be frank, for for us. Next one. And uh, since there is a one uh, case report showing there is a uh, uh, endoscopic pituitary uh, adenoma, afterwards all the a lot of um, uh, medical staff inside the same patients got infected. So that make us super aware of the, the uh, sinus operations during the, the surgery. So, so we wear, treat every patient as if a, a COVID positive and we wear N95 and doing nasal and scalp based surgery. Next. And uh, by the time we have reduced more than 50% of the operation time and we try to reduce the inpatient stay as soon as soon to let them uh, get, go uh, discharge as soon as possible. And also we conserve the PPE and reduce uh, patient flow. So we reduce more than 50%, but we're doing the cancer cases or semi-urgent cases like pediatric co cochlear implantations or cholecystoma surgery. We still keep that kind of surgery. Next. And for tracheostomy for the confirmed case, we actually try to avoid if possible, but and and delay as soon as delay as possible. And we will check actually the viral load where our um uh, ID colleagues will check the viral load. We try to get the viral load as low as possible before we proceed for a tracheostomy in the confirmed cases. We. Of course, we gang up full PPE according to the hospital guideline and we put them in a negative pressure surgical room. And we try to 
allow only one surgeon in, inside the uh, surgery and the, the se more senior staff will be recommended because if there's anything happens, he can handle it by himself and he don't need to call another doctors come in for help. Um, so to avoid uh, more doctors involved. Next. Okay, so uh, Puya, we finished Puya's slides. Puya is back with us, but uh, we'll have to go quickly. We have finished his slides. So this is for me, uh, one of the most important slides of today evening's uh, discussion. So uh, Arun will take it from here. And uh, whenever you uh, want me to click on the link, I will do that. So we get to see your video on YouTube. So, um, the, I leave the you know microscopy suction clearance alone for the time being, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the main thing is the flexible endoscopies are aerosol generating. Mm -hmm. uh, they're saying if the patient coughs or speaks, but it's ridiculous because you're going to ask the patient to speak, isn't it? Because that is how you check your vocal cords. So, um, so that's where we have to come up with something which will protect. And also the room in which you're going to do is also, you know, it's not going to be usable unless you do something. So we came up with this idea. If you click the link, you know, we can see the video. Yeah. Are we, are we, are we seeing it? Where are we seeing Hi, it? Hello. I'm Arun Ayer. I'm a consultant ENT surgeon based in Just University a Hospital Munkles Just in Lanarkshire. I, along with my colleagues, May Anesa and Nick Calder, have developed a technique to reduce aerosol. Were you seeing that a while back? No. no so your uh, screen sharing has stopped, actually. Okay. So what I have to do is... Go back to Zoom and uh, share screen. And there it is. No, not that one. This one. Okay. Optimize video. Okay. Share. Now, this is the beginning of the video. Can you see it, all of you? Yes. yes. Hi, everyone. I am Arun Ayer. I'm a consultant ENT surgeon based in. University Hospital Munkins in Lanarkshire. I, along with my colleagues, May Anesa and Nick Calder, have developed a technique to reduce aerosol formation when performing flexible endoscopic examination of the nose and larynx. This uses resources that is already available in the hospital. So I'll show you what the things you need. You need a closed anesthetic face mask, which comes in various sizes, to fit the patient properly. You need a filter, which is again readily available in the hospital, and a elbow shaped attachment with an opening for a suction. And uh, you can pass the endoscope through this. If you do not have an elbow shaped attachment, then you can use a T piece attachment and just close one end with the finger from a glove and make a small opening and you can pass the scope again through that. In order to hold the mask in place, the best uh, method is to use a CPAP mask holder. And again, this is available in most of the hospitals. But if you do not have a, a CPAP mask holder, then you can substitute using a linen tape, uh, which is used again in the anesthetic department for holding the endotracheal tube in place. I will now show you how this is done on a simulation model. You have to wear first full PPE before you do this and uh, make sure that uh, uh, there is uh, everyone around you is also protected. For demonstration purposes, I'm not going to use them because I don't want to waste the existing PPE. So this is the simulation model and you can see the, the uh, attachment that we made which is a face mask which is upside down so that the opening is right in front of the nose and the, to that i've attached, attached a t-piece i mean elbow attachment with an opening for the suction and a filter that we use in the anesthetic machines all these things are available in the hospital and uh, this is a harness that we use for cpap uh, masks that is also available in most of the hospitals so the procedure is done where you prep the scope, make sure that you are uh, donning the full PPE 
and then once you're ready the patient's nose is sprayed with local anesthetics in order to reduce the chance of sneezing and coughing and uh, then open this attachment and immediately put the scope in and then gradually pass the scope into the area near the nose and then since it is a straight line it goes in and then gently advance the scope and examine that area i can see the nasopharynx now and then passing the scope beyond the nasopharynx and i can see the whole of the larynx very clearly and uh, you are able to manipulate the scope the just like you would in a normal situation yeah just to you know in, in the interest of time so i think the, the only other thing i have to say is that you know um, we don't spray the nose we only use cotton ball uh, cotton pledges soaked in local anesthetic in the nose to uh, further reduce the any potential aerosols and uh, the other thing i want to say is that um, we we you know the we don't have to dispose of all these things you know these things can be sterilized but in the uk we have you know strict guidance on sort of uh, single use instruments and so we we are unfortunately using them as a, a, apart from the harness everything is disposable but i made a calculation according to our hospital's prices the whole setup costs only about 1 pound 84 which is you know 200 rupees so it's not bad actually even in the in the standards of any long. country this is brilliant i think this is uh, 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 going to be a a concrete solution um, rather than putting donning all those you know paraphernalia i think this will really this is a very practical solution to uh, do a lot of our diagnostic procedures in the nose uh, all our endoscopies you know so even uh, is there another port that can be introduced do you think we could use a suction and an endoscope at the same time is there anything else that would uh, aid us with uh, another port you you can actually buy specialist sort of you know um, endoscopic masks mm -hmm. i made this video at the time of the pandemic and you know we, we we didn't have to waste time and you know looking for these things but there's an italian company mm -hmm. making a specialist endoscopic mask mm -hmm. which has a port okay separate port so that you can use that oh, and the only problem is the, the opening there's another opening here as well so you'll have to use that for patients breathing mm -hmm. so that that endoscopic uh, mask has got two ports so i wrote to them and emailed them and all about a month ago but somehow you know they haven't responded to me initially i got an email saying that yeah yeah we'll get back to you but i don't know i think you know nothing has happened by the end of this uh, uh, pandemic i think you're going to be a rich man you're going to do something that's go you're going to patent and uh, we'll all be paying money to your company i guess <laughs> So Puya, uh, good to see you uh, back. Um, sorry to bother you, sir, uh, but uh, yeah. uh, can we have some uh, closure to this, sir? Yes, 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 yes. We are we are done with all our slides. The last uh, couple of slides, uh, Chetan. I think we have discussed most of what you had. Yeah, discussed. most of it we have discussed. I think we can skip all that. Yeah, we'll skip it, and uh, I'll go to the last uh, uh, couple of slides. Puya, do you have anything to add to the OPD procedures that uh, that uh, Uh, you know, to the, all the problems that we face in the OPD uh, or in the theater. I mean, we are your mic. Uh, uh, can the organizers switch on the mic? Can the organizers switch on? Yes, we yes. Can, I got can... back. I'm sorry for my. Oh. I finally got back in the meeting. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. There's uh, two teams. I've I've started to. Um, hear what our colleagues were saying i would like to point out a few things um first i'm i'm working on a international paper on masks so i cannot tell you more about that one thing that i would like to to say is that uh, cdc just changed the guideline for those who don't know oh they they say hear me i'm sorry uh, we lost you for a second but now we can hear you yes uh, okay. okay cdc just changed the guideline they saying that probably aerosol this uh, the that the virus cannot be spread through surfaces they're not sure about it there's only 10% of possibility to being infected with uh, um touching surfaces so this is just one thing 
The other thing that I would like to say that when you do an endoscopy or you even if you're doing the nasopharyngeal swab, if the problem is that you have to discriminate for aerosol um, dispersion or droplets, which is different. Uh, if we are thinking about droplets, if we if the patient is covered his mouth or her mouth with with uh, with the mask, the dispersion of the droplets will drop a lot. The problem is not doing the endoscopy. The problem is that if we do an endoscopy, we have to cover the camera, we have to cover the endoscope, and we have uh, to undress us. So which one comes first? Do we have to uh, undress ourselves before undress the camera or reverse? Yeah. Right. So, so here's the question. Mm. So here's the question, and that's the problem. That's for endoscopic sinus procedures or for diagnostic, that's, that's the main issues. And the other thing that I would like to say, if I just lost one, two hours of the lesson, uh, is there a particular um, uh, specifics on, uh, on what are the procedures that are allowed to do in, uh, in other countries? Can I uh, get back into that? Regarding, yeah, sure. otolo regarding otologic procedures. Yes, so uh, I'll answer that and I'll put it across to the panelists as well. So there are, there are, no, okay. guide there are no guidelines as to what, uh, I mean, in, till the lockdown got over, we had very strict guidelines not to do the uh, uh, unimportant cases or only the emergency cases were taken up for surgery. Uh, and all the cases that were taken up for surgery had to be uh, endorsed by a committee uh, in the hospital, which would look into uh, this list, whether they were really important or not. This was before the lockdown, uh, during the period of the lockdown. Now that the lockdown is over, we are allowed to do all kinds of cases. It's a free one now. So there is no restriction to the, uh, the type or the number of cases that we are allowed to do. There are no cases that are preferential. Uh, everything works as before. So this is post lockdown. Uh, yes, COVID positive cases are treated differently. Uh, there is a whole protocol uh, for, for uh, we went through the protocol of how to diagnose COVID uh, people and how to take them up for surgery. But if your question is, what are the procedures or surgeries that can be done or not done? All the time in India, all procedures can be done in the hospital. Uh, okay. And uh, anybody else who wants to discuss this? Yeah. Arun can uh, go ahead first. I think the autological procedures, you know, if we, we had a, a lot of discussion. Uh, there was an international sort of discussion on this. And uh, we just published a paper from the European archives, which I have attached to the slides. So what we decided that we have to decide on two categories. One, that cannot be postponed for whatever reason. That is classified into emergency, which has to be done immediately, or the one and and relative emergencies which can be done within four hours. For example, if somebody has got you know some major problem and uh, the facial palsy, for example, autogenic facial palsy, a big brain abscess, patient is going to die, you do it immediately. Okay, and uh, you do a swab, but sometimes you won't even get the results. But anything, a semi-emergency ones, like a sigmoid sinus thrombosis or other mastoiditis with abscess, then you can wait up to 48 hours and then you do the test and do the procedure. The other category is those that can wait. Again, that has been divided into two groups. One that can be indefinitely without any harm to the patient. They include stepidectomy, ossicloplasty, dry central perforations mm -hmm. and things like that. What about a cholesterol? What about a cholesterol? The, uh, the if you have a small retraction pocket that is completely dry and there's no bony erosion apart from uh, erosion of the sputum, that can go into that category provided you keep an eye on that. But all the cholesterol with bony erosion of the tegmen and chronically discharging air or erosion of the lateral canal and all, you can't you can't wait. So that we decided that probably to do it within three months. Subhash? 
Yeah, uh, similar guidelines. I won't go through the autology. You know, cholesterol is a is a surgical, medical surgical emergency. You need to operate, or a compressive uh, intracranial tumor or an extracranial tumor. But in head and neck, uh, we had a clear guidelines. Head and neck tumors uh, all came up. Came um, a tumor surgery was urgent, uh, and uh, they couldn't be postponed or rescheduled. So. Uh, we did uh, compressive thyroid uh, surgeries because those surgeries can uh, uh, go on to a significant airway. Um, they can cause significant airway compression. They come as an emergency. So we did elective uh, trachea, uh, thyroidectomies for that. And uh, uh, parotid malignancies, uh, we just uh, rescheduled those cases. Um, Pure papillary thyroid carcinomas needing a lobectomy or a, a hemithyroidectomy, we didn't do during the COVID era. We just postponed them because, you know, when you, when you diagnose a papillary thyroid carcinoma, you can uh, wait unless there is a, a lymph node metastasis or a, you know, airway invasion. So laryngectomies we carried out, neck dissections we carried out. But the interesting thing was... Um, you know, we, like in UK, we follow something called faster cancer treatment. In, uh, uh, in that treatment paradigm, we see quite a lot of patients who are suspected to have cancer, uh, like maybe dysphagia, change of voice. They needed endoscopy, and then if you see something, they need a biopsy, which could be cancerous. Those kind of cases um, uh, with the high aerosol generating procedures, uh, needed special consideration. We needed to be it's almost certain uh, to take them to the surgery. So in the summary, uh, in uh, New Zealand society uh, had a guideline uh, where uh, surgeries were divided into three uh, categories. One is definite urgent surgeries need to be done, whether COVID positive or negative. And the second one is semi-urgent. And the third one was all the rest of the procedures. Uh, rest of the procedure included pediatric tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy didn't, was not done during this period because risk is too high. Uh, otological procedures um, like chronic mastoiditis or a tympanic membrane repair was not done. Uh, only cholesterolomas were done. Uh, sinus surgery is completely gone uh, from, um, from uh, theater schedules uh, and um, urgent procedures like Quincy drainage, uh, epistaxis control, uh, or large neck abscesses or foreign body, um, that they had a very thoughtful consideration where the patient goes uh, in a green zone or a red zone. Uh, if the patient had fever, cough, or anything associated with this, they would go to red zone till the COVID test is negative. They won't come to the green zone, uh, but we could still operate on them. So. That's not only department or individual, it's the whole hospital had guidelines mm -hmm. on uh, things. Great. Perfect. Yeah. So thanks, uh, Subhash. So we are coming well, to... I can uh, disseminate some of the guidelines if you sorry, guys want sorry to... Sorry to interrupt you, sir. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can we just have a, a last few comments from the panelists because we have already... There are no, no more comments. We, we are done. We are just finishing uh, the last, uh, 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 the concluding slide. Sorry, sorry to you, sir. <laughs> so thanks, everybody. So it's been uh, great. So I'd like to leave uh, all of you with this uh, uh, couple of thoughts. So I think what are the lessons we have learned from COVID? I think professional lessons, we have to accept that an existential threat exists and uh, we have to continue to live with what... Uh, uh, is with us and we have to also prepare ourselves for a future worse of pandemic. So these are lessons uh, that we can take forward in case, uh, because viruses will never stop uh, to come. Um, uh, I'm sure economically there'll be a lot of uh, uh, take home uh, messages. Uh, the non-essential jobs uh, will soon be identified. And hopefully as doctors, we consider our jobs to be more essential jobs and uh, uh, the governments will probably start investing on public health systems and more essential jobs uh, in, in place of non-essential uh, jobs. Philosophically, I would like to conclude again by saying do not take the world for granted. Appreciate what one has and uh, learn to love the people around oneself. Life is always not forever. So, uh, so the fundamental key 
to addressing a crisis as told by Tanvir Nasir is for our leaders to not only be honest about the situation and uh, what you're going to do about it, but that you do so with clarity, humility and heart. So as to remind people, we are in this together. So thanks once again uh, to this wonderful group of people who've uh, been with us today, panelists, organizers, and the participants of Baird, this three hour marathon. It's one of my longest webinars. And uh, uh, thanks for uh, participating. Thanks for being, it's an absolute pleasure, honor and a privilege. Uh, 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 so I think it's, uh, it's nice. Richard, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Thank you and, uh, and the audience who are really um, patient. And yeah. most of your questions are not answered. We are very sorry about that, uh, but probably yeah. next time. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's, it's a hot topic. It needs to be debated more and more. So thanks everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks for joining Stay. us so late. It's been great having you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Now, Chetan. Great to uh, see you again, Arun. We should share the whiskey yeah. and uh, Dr. Ved. Thank you very much from down south, New Zealand. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Thank, Thank you. Nice, nice meeting thanks. you all. Thanks, Dr. Nice meeting you all. Arun, white to Subhash. Bye bye. Oh, thank you, Subhash. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. thanks so, Dr. Sampat uh, Chandra Rao. Uh, it's our pleasure. And thanks all panelists for joining us on this uh, occasion. Thanks okay. and good night uh, to all the uh, attendees. And Thank you, at the end, good be luck. safe uh, because you are the front runners and we need more uh, you to be safe. So please be safe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.